yet, if God wills that they continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Hello everyone, this is Jose Herrera with the O3XX series, and with me, my hermano, Tyler Pollock. Today we have the privilege of having Gary Hess join us. Gary is a Marine Corps veteran, founder, and executive director of the Veterans Alliance for Holistic Alternatives, also known as VAHA. He is also the CEO of Teleleaf and partner of Dynamic Growth Solutions. With 11 years of service in the Marine Corps and personal experience with PTSD, traumatic brain injury, and chronic pain, Gary has become a leading advocate for medical cannabis as a tool for post-traumatic recovery. Through VAHA, Gary collaborates with patients, medical professionals, and lawmakers to promote evidence-based solutions and educations on the benefits of medical cannabis and to reduce barriers to access. He worked closely with Dr. Sue Sisley and the Scottsdale Research Institute in their fight against the DEA and has even testified in Congress for the legalization of medical cannabis in Louisiana and North Carolina. 
As the CEO and founder of Teleleaf, Gary connects thousands of patients with licensed physicians for affordable and convenient access to cannabis. He is also a partner in Dynamic Growth Solutions, providing construction and turnkey solutions for indoor cannabis cultivation. Gary's post-service career includes successful ventures in real estate, an award-winning antique lumber and milk work company, and executive roles in the oil and gas industry and federal contracting. He holds a Bachelor of Science from Wartburg College and is currently pursuing a PhD in Cognitive Behavior and Brain Sciences. Tyler and I want to express our deepest gratitude to Gary for sharing with us his profound and powerful story. It takes immense courage, determination, and willpower to overcome the toll of war and to guide others towards healing. Semper Fidelis, we hope you enjoy our conversation story is probably you know why yeah, why yeah. we want you here and and kind of what you're involved in so yeah um, wherever you want to start i mean we typically you know thank you first off for coming on but whenever we have guys come on um we kind of give them the opportunity to, to start off from the beginning if you want give a little backstory about where you came from and what you went through and then where you're at today you know we're all the majority of people that probably listen to this or um you know infantry guys whatever branch you know combat arms that's kind of who we catered we started catering to our guys but it kind of spreads and um you know you're you're talking to a rock eater right here yourself jose's you know the leader of this whole thing and and we just want to try to help guys get better whatever that means you know whatever that means whatever you know each each person has their own recipe for making it work for themselves yeah and we just want to try to stem this this uh nonsense of dudes checking out too early you know yeah yeah and that's uh yeah that's purpose cause passion for me and i uh, i got here because i was one of those dudes so yeah whenever you guys want to start it let's let's uh let's go man I, I just it's been a long time since i really opened myself up to this conversation especially with other guys who have been there so when i you know when i hear you talking about that 2009 ambush i'm like all right I'm not talking to the fucking policymakers that I, that I generally talk to on a regular basis, right? This is, and you brought up Lejeune and I'm like, holy shit, man. It just, it, it brought me back there for a minute. And I think that's why the conversation really opened up. So thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah no. And yeah. any anything we get into, if you don't, if you, you know, want to listen back, you, you can share whatever you feel. I mean, whatever you're comfortable with, but if you say some things that you might not want, to make it out there jose will chop it up he's pretty yeah good, so. and, and i'll give you guys that that uh that permission because that you know what i i don't really i don't think i ever watch um the media opportunities that 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 have been given in some of the speaking performances it just uh because when i speak I, I generally put myself back in those situations and uh whatever happens happens as long as there was a good reaction then I then I then I did it right, right. I, I don't like getting in there and being self-critical. So if there's something in there that you think might harm our brand uh, or or your message, just feel free to take it out. Roger that. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, there's a there's a science behind it, which I don't. So we have like these main, mainstream paradigms that are are very relativistic, and at the at the end of that is this kind of like solipsism, right? This like one-dimensional view of how respectability and identity politics should be. And what that does, is it puts a crux on the human dimension. And what I mean by that is that every one of us has this inner narrative identity and that inner narrative identity is, is non-linear. It's full of disjunctures and junctions. It's, it's a life experience that is novel and cannot be framed um, as it has been for hundreds of years as a result of you know, Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, there's a beginning, a middle, and end. And, and that's not even true of our life experiences. And what's difficult about articulating that, especially to the, the mediated sense, is that on one level, it because of the, the current abu and the current tension and hyperpolarization is any attempt to try to say, hey, you know, have you ever thought about this? Or have you ever approached it this way? It's almost like, oh, you're trying to somehow cause disruption and create division and again it doesn't represent who we are uh, the veteran demographic is, is such a, a very unique and antiquated 
uh, demographic in the sense that we come from various backgrounds with various experiences that will want can't and be cannot be expressed through the medium of mediation meaning media so i always always say that you know if they want to take us on i'm i'm glad to to, to carry that burden because there there's going to come a time where we're going to have to approach it that way um and i think what's happening at least kind of like on this like evolutionary uh, perspective is that there's this network state being constructed as a result of the times, meaning that groups are are essentially they're not becoming tribal. I mean, there's a sense of epistemic, you know, tribalism where if your knowledge and my knowledge, my origins of knowledge, they're not, you know, in sync with one another, we're going to part ways and become tribal. But in terms of the survivability of the veteran demographic and who we are, because the mainstream doesn't allow us to share our story where it's like. You can be a different race, creed, have a whole different religion. I can have the complete opposite. And then somehow at the end of the day, in the context of combat and war, we still love each other as our own compatriots. That's not representative of, you know, the Western hemisphere, unless you're in a warrior society. Yeah. So with, so with that, I'll, I'll shut my suck. And, uh, <laughs> but no, no I, yeah. Go ahead. I, I, I agree with you, right? Because that's one of the things with uh, that we we're, we're very careful with with the Baja brand, with who the mission is to, to beat them at their own game is we have to, we can't come out and start stepping on people's necks, right? Which is what we're used to and, and, and obviously a faster way to the end result. But we have to take that energy and put it in a language and, and a, uh, in an experience that is comfortable and understanding for them, right? And that's a fucking painful process. That's a painful process to, to take the rigidness and, and what needs to transpire and put it in the snowflake language and then present it in a way that is understood and makes everybody happy. And so it's, it fucking sucks, but it's necessary. And, uh, and, and we're becoming pretty good at it. At the same time, we don't entertain a lot of that bullshit. And, um, and, and at the same, we've been accepted at all tables. And, uh, and so we're doing something right here. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think I was reading up on your website, on the Baja website, and uh, one of the, I think where a lot of guys in the beginning started out doing great work in terms of advocating for, for veterans is that, yes, there was some minor research that was being uh, kind of like uh, paralleled with the mission. But now that the fact that you're using academia uh, institutions that have some authority uh, to back up what it is that you're saying gives you that veracity to compete or at least remain relevant uh, to the conversation which is something that i fear with a lot of individuals that begin like kind of like grassroots trying to make a change is that they're trying to voice their opinion but in a world that's highly censored and again you know that, that the mimetic variability within our, our mainstream arena is is not suited for the rawness of, of who we really are yeah. and that's a scary thing for a lot of folks who who wouldn't know you know what Again, going back to like what an ambush is or what it's like to fucking survive at a very early age. Yeah, I mean, pure chaos and fear and be able to operate in the in the, in the midst of it. And, uh, you know, that's that's a trained skill set at the same time. It, it has a, a shit ton to do with uh, with character and timing. And, and I'll be the first one to tell you, you know, in the number of engagements we've been in, some of them. I performed incredibly well and the others I'm just like I fucking question myself just because mm. you weren't the fucking rock star right and and there was fear that kind of prevented action or whatever that case was right that's a human fucking experience and the fact that you know I you know you know we'll get into this conversation as far as the struggle but uh you I mean, I'll, I'll be absolutely raw with you but what I'd say with that rawness is the point that I've gotten to now is you have to meet people where they are most people ask surf they, they ask questions not knowing or even understanding what kind of response if someone is being absolutely authentic what kind of response that they're going to receive at the end of that question and so you have to know if that person's ready or not unfortunately and if if you know if you come out and answer these questions with the rawness that you know we're used to within our own culture because we don't have time to be the nice guy we're fucking dying um you may never see that person again. 
yeah. because you offend them in that in in, in that manner. So <clears throat> let's go. Let's. Uh, I don't know if you did. We hit the record button. Yeah, yeah we did. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I I cut in because you were getting into some juicy stuff about your childhood and being stabbed. And I was like, wait a second. Like this, he he came from a a unique situation. So yeah. Um, and, and, and if go ahead. Yeah, if you want to just backpedal and and maybe get it, if if you want to start off with your childhood or talk about any of that stuff or what led you to be, you know, um, to join up and and serve and and do do the work and then you know continue to do the work after you know um whatever you want wherever you want to take it this is free flow so we just we just kind of yeah. bounce off one another no so first of all uh you know gary Hess with the uh, veterans alliance for holistic alternatives i'm the executive director for the uh, veterans alliance for holistic alternatives we also have a uh, telemedicine access platform specifically for cannabis called teleleaf where we operate in 22 different states uh, and then we have uh, an antheogenic church, uh, which we have not released yet, and it's called the Warrior Tribe Medicinal Assembly, where we're using essentially shamanic practices to truly give veterans and other uh, people within the trauma community options to heal. And so, first of all, I would be the first one to tell you that never in a million years did I, did I think I would be here talking to you about the medical benefits of weed. Right. Uh, I grew up in southern Louisiana, uh, graduated at the top of my class in high school, you know, grew up in a swamp fishing and hunting uh, athletics my entire life, uh, played Division One ball and uh, joined the Marine Corps. I was in the Marine Corps for a little over 10 years, got out uh, chief operating officer for an oil and gas uh, company um, and, and a construction company with uh, you know, significant that when I joined their ranks, we went from 17 to almost 200 million, you know, within a three, uh, within a three year period. Um, if I looked at marijuana or said marijuana growing up, my, my father and my grandfather would whip my ass. And, and, you know, from, a um, from, a, a product of the war on drugs, you know, uh, cannabis was non-productive. You were a stoner, you know, it, it equaled failure. It was addictive. It was the gateway drug to so many others. And so what happened is I joined the Marine Corps, you know, artillery, uh, you know, for the first uh, stand on on the enlisted side, achieved the rank of, uh, of sergeant. And then I converted. I became an infantry officer. Um, and uh, I was an infantry officer from uh, 04 to uh, to the end of 08. You know, during those heavy, heavy levels of conflict in uh, in Iraq, most of my time was spent in Iraq. Um, tremendous amount of conflict, right? And the and the uh, the first pump uh, right outside of Kaim. We were the company outside of Kaim on the Syrian border. Um, we became essentially the next Fallujah, and we had essentially close to three hundred engagements in less than one hundred eighty days within this mm -hmm. small border town. And it's uh, we had problems getting. Uh, getting additional support and reinforcements, right? There was a lot of ego from from high level command and then what was being asked. And so, you know, that huge balls of the company commander went around the battalion, battalion commander and started getting reinforcements from regiment uh, just because of the level of conflict. And, you know, that's when Zerkawi's guys were in uh, and, and we had some, some pretty heated exchange with Zerkawi's uh, guys. It was... Um, it was it was nothing short of the shit that you read in the books right before we all go we just nobody i would never wish my situation on anyone but before you go you find yourself in those moments that right this is what i've been training for put me in the shit and let me see what i'm made of and uh let's just say we got everything and then some uh both deployments you know my uh I went uh, 05 on the Syrian border. Uh, we came back, worked up seven months. We went back to a small town uh, between Fallujah and Ramadi. And, um, you know, I was operating with an independent group on the, uh, on the south side of the river, which was essentially no man's land. And um, uh, December of uh, 2006, right before that deployment ended, uh, there was a, full-size tracks with dump truck loaded with C4 that ran into the house we were occupying and detonated. And uh, that is, is 
for me was uh, was a game changer. Everything after that looked different, right? It it, it didn't make sense anymore. I didn't. Uh, there was no fire. There was no, you know, that that service, that that purpose beyond the self. Just something shifted. Um, I can explain it now. I didn't know what it was back then. Um, there was a significant level of, I mean, it was a significant period of time where I didn't tell anyone, right. And the fear of, you know, being pushed out of the ranks and your platoon, who I refused, you know, evacuation, uh, I think for probably a month and a half, um, anytime there was physical activity, it, it was nausea and throwing up, I, I threw up every morning. Um, it, it was, it was, it was not a good situation and uh eventually led to a transition out of the marine corps and then i turned my hands over to uh those entrusted with my care in the va and the western model of medicine and uh and and um really subjected to the pharmaceutical strategy i became addicted to the pharmaceuticals and at the end of 10 years you know uh taking my own life was the best answer right you're talking to someone who was whose hand was shaking so bad that I squeezed the first round off. So I didn't, uh, I wouldn't miss with the second one. And uh, I can talk about these things now just because of the work that I've put into it and, and the, um, the intentional work that I, I continue to wake up and, and uh, address every day with, which is the addicts, addicts creed, be authentic, do it, surrender the outcome and do uncomfortable work, right? You have to wake up every day and approach that situation. If you were going to, uh, be able to emotionally regulate, you know, some of the thoughts and emotions that that come up on a day to day basis, you know, and some of the things that we were talking about earlier. Um, so with that, uh, instead of taking my life, I smoked a joint and it did everything that the that the medicines were supposed to do. And um, it made me incredibly angry, but it also put me on a mission to find the answers. I needed to find the answers. Uh, to provide to my father and my grandfather and and every and, and those who were important to me um, and explain to others why this medicine was working, why this natural plant was working for me, why I was doing everything that the medicines were supposed to do, and why in three months of integrating this on a daily basis, I was off all the medications prescribed by the VA, right? And so that has essentially uh, led to the creation of this organization um, we do a lot of national and, and state level advocacy, both for cannabis and, uh, and psychedelics. Um, and we use cannabis uh, to essentially do 80% of that work, to do the intentional work, to, um, to extract and process those emotions that are, that are rooted in our subconscious. And, and for those, like the three of us sitting here, uh, whose trauma and experiences uh, like that ambush are, are so deep that we cannot consciously access them and we have to tap into the unconscious. And that is where the psychedelic psychedelics and the entheogenics, uh, and that's where our retreats, performance optimizing retreats come in through the warrior tribe medicinal assembly. And, and so I'm, I'm, these organizations are created for the patient by the patient is me and built a team to find these answers. We have a medical advisory board. I sit on a national cannabis round table. I've sued the drug enforcement agency, uh, and the U.S. Attorney General and, and opened up research uh, for cultivation facilities to provide for research and, and start opening some of these avenues. Because the truth is, is our guys are fucking dying and they're dying every day. And, and, and there's, there's not a day that goes by that, that my phone is, is somebody's not tagging me just because I'm in this conversation, right? This is the fight that I'm fighting on a daily basis. But you see very quickly and very simplistically why they make these medicines illegal um, and, and why they continue to prevent access. Why? Because they fucking work. They work. And it's, uh, it's a very disruptive model to the Western model of medicine who hinges on the profitability from the pharmaceutical strategies that they're employing. Those pharmaceutical strategies are what's killing us. And so that's what I'm here to talk about today. That's what I do on a daily, daily basis. Uh, there's a lot of shit going on in this world. If you're asking me about all that other shit, there's a good chance I don't know anything about it because this is this is where my focus is. So um, I'd love to open a conversation up. I'm, look, I'm a I'm a, I'm gonna give it to you, you know, in the way that it comes to me, and, and I'm not not holding any punches here. Um, this is the same the same conversation that I have with our national leaders. 
uh, in DC. I've had them two weeks ago. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm headed there. I'm actually headed to a uh, debate hosted by the Washington Post in South Carolina this Thursday. Um, and then the following week, uh, we're going to meet with uh, some significant um, um, leaders at, at the Capitol uh, who are you know, uh, pushing this legislation, uh, one by the name of Representative Dave Joyce, who is a very a moderate caucus leader in the Republican Party, um, who is a gatekeeper to, to decisions that need to be made. And so he's ready to get in the conversation. He and, and Nancy Mace, and there are some other ones that are getting in this conversation. And uh, we're going to be there to represent guys like you um, to provide an authentic voice of, of, of why we need this legalized you know, so we don't have to continue to be criminal criminals in front of our families and children. Um, Jim, sometimes I get long winded. Just feel free to jump no. in at any time. No, yeah, that, that was wow, man. Yeah, I'm so grateful that <laughs> this conversation started off this way because you know, I, I we just don't know. Um, a lot of times we have brothers of ours, you know, refer people and say, "Hey, get this guy on there," and we're like, you know, we don't know what the approach is going to be but you're a real one straight shooter. And that's, we appreciate that. So yeah, I, I have a quick question though. When you were talking, I want to backpedal a little bit at that point where you felt like, you know, you were, you were, you were clutching that pistol at your depths and you decided to smoke that joint. What was that like for you knowing your background and where you came from, you know, maybe how taboo or against, you know, your, your, what your family's ideas of this were and you decided you know what you know i need something different and how did you get into that like did you have someone suggest it to you you know or i'm just curious as, as to what that yeah. looked like yeah so you, you know there's there's a lot to that question right there and the way that i said it essentially took a lot of time and condensed it into a very simple sentence and so um it's there's a book coming out. You, you, both of you keep saying the word taboo. Um, and, and that word, it's funny because that was a suggestion uh, to the title of the book. So it, it's called Safe Again, uh, Beyond the Stigmas, Through Emotional Processing and Back from Hell. And that's going to come out, uh, you know, probably three to three to four months from now. But it talks, it essentially it answers this this question. And uh I understand, I understand, you know, obviously everybody's different, everyone's unique, but the mind of the, the military veteran who takes their life, it's not an impulsive decision, right? The truth is, is that we're fucking tired. I, you know, there was, and here's why. <clears throat> when that dump truck uh, came through the building, the physiological responses that uh, transpired, that fight or flight uh, that transpired, um that chemical cocktail that situation didn't end the way that i wanted it to nor the way that i trained for it to and the truth is, is that i didn't have a file folder for what happened we did yeah. everything right. we did everything right we stopped that truck right before it hit the building i'm looking at the son of a bitch in his eyes in a mask i went back in to get a uh, a heavier radio so we can call in air support and i'm looking through the window right at him and you know he's, he's sitting there leaning on the truck he's hitting that secondary uh trying to get that door open and as soon as that door popped that was the last thing i remember you know i come to consciousness and right away i'm like i got my shit i got my shit right and, and so not even being aware you're not mindful of what you're feeling at the time but when you go back and you walk that situation through so many times right there was exhilaration because i was still alive right i'm looking around these indigenous personnel and i'm, I'm thinking okay they fucking got me i didn't even realize it was my own guys and and <clears throat> but the exhilaration and the joy of being alive and i and i get up and you know uh uh, the, I start to move back outside and the, and the first person I see is staff sergeant. He's got somebody else on the side of him. And uh, one moment I'm happy to be alive. The next moment, moment you know, Josh, uh, uh, just a great friend of mine, sparring partner of mine, he's dead, right? Josh is gone. And, uh, and, and I walked up to the top of that building and, and what I saw is uh, unlike anything I ever thought I would see. This is not the first time seeing the, the mutilation and the grotesque. 
these two deployments had been nothing short of day in and day out, absolute mutilation, women, children. It was, it was just not good. And uh, from a human experience, but this was, this was my friend, man. This was my brother. And um, it, uh, he didn't have time to put his gear on and uh, it, his acts were selfless. And, um, and, and the acts that I took to make sure every piece of him went home, it's something that you'll never be able to describe or explain to anyone. And so how do you come home and you tell someone that you're afraid of macaroni, right? It took him right here, you know, right here above his eyes. Looks like a wax museum. His entire brain, unscathed, was laying right next to him. How do you explain that, right? How do you explain what that feels like? How do you explain that what the emotions are that, yeah. that you, you know, your can of tobacco that he borrowed, right, is, is yeah. one of the last things you pull from him, right? You, you can't explain that. And so you come home. And now sitting in a sushi restaurant, right? Because it is an unknown. And because my body is detecting every, everything coming through every sensory cortex is now being detected for a threat because of that unprocessed emotion that I do not have a file folder for, right? So what it's doing is pushing my, just through a thought alone, and through a multiple sensory experience, it's, it's pushing my body back into that same physiological state as that dump truck coming through the building because of that unprocessed emotion. And right, and so when this is happening, and I start closing in, and my blood pressure is 200 over 140, and we got to leave abruptly with my wife, and all of a sudden that pattern is created, and we can't go anywhere in public, we can't engage socially, we become angry, every emotion uh, eventually gets rerouted to anger. This is not a conscious decision. These are the me mechanisms of trauma and unprocessed emotion left untreated. It creates a dysregulation in the HPA axis, which is your hypothalamus, your, hypothalamus, your pituitary and your adrenal gland, right? We're producing cortisol and adrenaline, those th same things that allowed us to survive and, ma and maintain our vis vigilance and survive is what is killing us back home. What happens when we go to the doctor, right? First is insurance. Then you sign the liability waivers, unless you go into the VA, right? But uh, it's all the same thing. They just have it covered and packaged in the VA. But you have insurance, liability wa waivers, blood work, and then diagnostics where they do the scan. So if something's wrong with you, it's going to be a very acute and it has to be handled right now. There's no pattern recognition. There's no conversation about stress. There's no conversation about uh, the dysregulation in your HPA access and the chronic stress that is, and, and what's going on with your relationships and your sleep. And, and, and the truth is, is that the answers are that simple if we start looking at them in the right way. But what happens is we go to these doctors and they give us these fucking pills and we go home and our situations get worse, right? We have this false hope that now this is the new answer. All of a sudden, six weeks later, there's a huge fucking blowout again. Your wife is leaving you. She's taking the fucking kids. You're not going to work. You're not showing up on time. You get into the bottom of a fucking bottle. You can't live without popping the pills. And you go back to the doctor and they say, hey, don't use these. Use these, right? Mm motherfucker should be put in jail and that's the truth and and when you and, and look that's the step on the throat mentality the rawness right but you, you can't communicate that right i took this is no shit this is a real story and I'd, I'd love to get him on with you one day uh first sergeant joe robnack uh three two you know he ended his career at three two with me he was my senior enlisted uh, 13 years later, I'm standing in front of the white house and I uh, just joe speaking to me and I called joe joe how you do it pause he says not good I'm like damn this is this is a guy that i did not reach out to because i was ashamed of who i had become this was a leader that i looked up to and and he was just the epitome of, of what the marine corps was he won every fucking award that you could possibly imagine in a marine corps he just he was just uh loved by you know the marines underneath him and i call him and he's just like i'm not good so I cancel my flight and I go, you know, stay with him for three days. And it's the same thing. It's mm -hmm. the same thing. The mechanisms are all the same. You know, I don't 
care if you're a high performing athlete or if you're someone who in the military who experienced significant trauma, the emotional processing is the healing process and the emotional processing and emotional maintenance that is needed to get our bodies back to a homeostatic balance. Uh, it's, it, it's all the same. The mechanisms are the same, but these are the things that are not being talked about when you go uh, sit with the healthcare professionals who are entrusted with your care and who are covered by your insurance and, and who are backed by all the FDA flawed clinical trials that are approved for the medicines that they fucking prescribe you. It's all a bunch of bullshit and it chases profitability. Don't get me wrong. The people in the medical community, the doctors, those are service professionals, service oriented professionals, and they're absolutely great people. The doctors, the nurses, the support staff, they are great people. But these, this ideology and this strategy that is being implemented, it, it, it just supersedes and, and it just precedes their time. Uh, and there's such institutional, deep institutional barriers that um, these biases and natural, natural biases and strategies are implemented at the educational level, right? After you finish that four-year degree and now you're in medical school, right? Now we're the, the pharmaceutical influence that is embedded in, in those institutions and every single one of them. And it's also the same one that's embedded uh, that continues to fill the, the, the funding buckets up at the national and state level from a lobbying standpoint, right? 83% of decision makers in government leadership receive funds uh, from pharmaceutical companies. That's what drives the decisions that are governing the health care of the men and women who go out and protect this nation. Now we're coming back to a nation who doesn't even want to hear a voice or refusing to hear a voice. And so we're being forced, and this is exactly what I did, to be a criminal, to use natural plant medicines and find real options to heal so that I could get back to the dinner table with my family. Right. And that is in the cannabis conversation that is in the psychedelic conversation, all products that have been made schedule one and illegal. And that you can spend a lifetime sentence in jail if you utilize these things. These are the things that are fucking helping us. Right. So excuse my language here, but it's uh, it's incredibly passionate to me. Um, and it's, you know, when I when I want to talk about. um you know, that Western model of medicine and the pharmaceutical strategies, I still see it, right? I still see it every day. It's not, it's not just the military veterans. This, this organization is just as much as for my mother and father, right? And the seven out of 10 Americans who experienced trauma in their lifetime, right? Cannabis is not the gateway drug. Childhood sexual trauma is the gateway drug, right? Domestic abuse is the gateway drug. Combat trauma is a gateway drug. Unprocessed, untreated trauma, pharmaceutical dependency, is the fucking gateway drug, right? And those are the real conversations that we're having. So, um, yeah, the mission- sad, this, this sad part about that is, you know, if the combat trauma is a gateway drug, you know, not that I don't agree 100% with the, you know, the way kids are brought up and what happens to them there. But the difference is, is that when we come back, we got it just handed to us. They got to seek it out. The gateway drug that they're, you know, trying to cure whatever or, or erase their mind, they got to seek that out on their own. And it's a yeah. more difficult pathway. We come back and they're like, here, just take this. You know, and me and Jose, I'm sure this this could blanket cover anybody in the combat arm spectrum or military, have friends that have taken their lives because the VA prescribed them painkillers opioids whatever it was and to me that personally prevented me and i know a lot of guys from even going in and talking to anybody because they're like if if you know i can talk to my homie my brother about stuff i'm struggling with and they're gonna hear me out i know where they're what their background is if i go into somebody and i think that they're you know the end state is just them saying here take this it'll make it better well i know lutz killed himself because he was on a bender, you know, like from, from pills and his mind wasn't right because of what they're giving to him. Well, I'm not going to go open up to anybody that that that's going to be their, you know, their their prescription or their, you know, treatment for me is here. Take this like and you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and just think about how basic this conversation is. Right? You're right. They gave us the drugs and they contain a prescribed the drug that we're taking our lives with right so they have what's called the uh 
the LD50 lethal dose with 50% of the people who take a dose at a certain, uh, a medicine at a certain dose will be fatal, right? Opioids is one of the mm-hmm. highest risks on there. Cannabis, zero. It is absolutely impossible to overdose. So from a legalization standpoint, right? We're going to continue to prescribe medicines Tylenol is on that list, right? You can die if you take too much Tylenol, yeah. right? The, the over-the-counter medication, which is becoming one of the biggest enemies uh, to the veterans. A third of the veteran community suffers, more than a third suffers with multiple chronic conditions. And what is recommended, right? The Motrin, the ibuprofen, the Tylenol is killing our fucking kidneys. It's killing our liver. And we're seeing that now. Some of the best men and women that I've served with are, are now dealing with, uh, you know, Staff Sergeant Wargo is one of them. Um, you know, had a you know, blew out his eye socket because he was coughing so violently because of the uh, ulcer that was created in his stomach because the only thing that would help his, uh, the lower back pain, which is where most veterans carry their stress, uh, are the over-the-counter drugs. He wouldn't take the opioids, but even the recommendations that we have grown up that these are the answers for so long, they're fucking killing us. They're killing us. So this, this whole conversation uh, Nita comes back and, and it needs to come back to where are the answers and what are they, right? And, and so it goes back to the conversation we started having with our kids, right? There's a, there's a level of preparedness, but there's also <clears throat> we need to teach our children. Why? Because uh, for someone who is overcoming trauma, we have lost our true self have lost uh what that feels like we have lost our identity we have lost our ability to feel emotions we have lost there's a lot of things that are lost and uh and 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 we have gotten so far that mind body disconnect we have gotten so far from our true self that the healing process for guys like you and i is to get back to that true self right and so the cure for the pain is in the pain. That pain is in that unprocessed emotion that we do not want to get to, that we've built a life around uh, those hot coals, just layered and layered. I, you know, I work 18, 20 hours a day because I am fucking productive. And that's what I'm doing. I'll never forget and all that. You know what's gonna, you know who's gonna lose that fight? You, right? So what we want is longevity, right? What we need is small unit leaders who can live in the present to put back into their communities or that can we can you know be community activators that's how we're going to change the nonsense and the chaos that is going on here so getting back to the the conversation with the children is not only to have the preparedness uh and and you know placing their mind forward to be able to see that but also having the ability to let the mind go and be absolutely present and to be able to go within and understand what breath work, what meditation is, right? If we can start having those conversations at a young age so that we can teach those emotional regulation skills and learn that the answers lie within us, right? The most powerful pharmacist in the world is the human body, right? We Mm -hmm. make our own medicines. If you look at the medicines that they treat us with, the glucocorticoids for diabetes and, 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 and every other thing, um, the, the asthma inhalers, right? I'm, I'm diagnosed, uh, I was re-diagnosed with, uh, with asthma in 2017. I was an infantry officer, I was in the best shape of my life. Um, my blood pressure at that, you know, at times is 200 over 140. You know, my resting heart rate is just extremely elevated. Uh, I was re-diagnosed with asthma and, and put on multiple inhalers a, a day, you know, um, w- with no end in sight. And But what are these medicines? They're adrenaline and their cortisol, the same drugs that are creating this imbalance, they're pumping back in us to chronically suppress the symptoms. And it is, is actually exacerbates our condition. So um, going within, teaching heart coherent breathing techniques uh, so that, that we can bring, uh, regulate the HPA access um, and, and, and create that homeostatic static balance, reduce the allostatic load. And then that's where we can start doing the intentional work to, to, to create those new habits. But, you know, for us and for those who experience trauma, we got to walk it backwards. For children, most of them are already there, right? 
we just need to walk it forwards with him so we can guide that conversation in the right direction. And so this it's an awesome experience because and just the timing of it in my own internal healing, and a lot of it was because of my children. Um, you know, I believed in something that more than myself, I wasn't worth anything. Uh, I wasn't going to continue to go on. And so doing it for them, but in the healing process, I have learned a technique that I wish somebody would have taught me at a young age. And now I'm, you know, my, my son and I are, are now going through uh, ice bath training where you have a six-year-old that's literally, you know, getting in a, a 32, 37 degree ice bath for up to two minutes, right? Because he's able to focus on his breathing and the internal chaos that he's feeling and he's not avoiding or abandoning, he's sitting in it, right? And he's regulating that response and he's regaining control of that autonomic nervous system. That is exactly what is wrong with the veteran community right now. And the doctors are not providing us that answer, right? I mean, I, I can go on for days because this is, this is what our program does. It's, if, if we start looking at pattern recognition, which is a lot of the, the Eastern modalities are built on is the pattern recognition. If I can look at the fluctuation uh, in my heart rate variability, if I can look at my resting heart rate, if I can look at the quality of my sleep and my slow wave sleep and my REM sleep, knowing that if I've experienced trauma, my body does not, not, does not let me access those two until I start processing it. Um, if, if, if I'm, if I'm able to look at those patterns along with some of the, uh, you know, the biological, uh, vitals, you can see that your autonomic nervous system is out of balance yet in the past 10 to 15 years that I've been to a doctor, no one has ever called me and asking me, Hey, let's devise a strategy to reduce these pharmaceuticals or, Hey, I think you're let's have a chronic stress conversation, right? The fact that you were a combat veteran and you experienced a significant amount of trauma, there's a good chance you were dealing with a chronic stress that is leading to all of these physical symptoms. If the, 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 the migraines, the irritable bowel syndrome, the, uh, the, the joint pain, you know, I've had three doctors that told me they wanted to, to come in and do surgery on my neck. Mm -hmm. Um, the back pain, the hip pain, the, uh, the compulsive thoughts. I got to the point where I was literally seeing people. And, uh, and that's something you can't come out and tell a doctor because what happens, you, you end up on the third floor, yeah. you know, for, and uh, locked away, taken from, from your support systems and, and, uh, and then given Motrin. And, and it's, uh, it's a shame, but it's, it's, it's a reality. It's a reality that, that we live in. And so, I think I started the story with first Sergeant Joe Rovnack. Well, um, I took him eight months after, you know, I, I re, uh, reinitiate contact with him. I took him to the national hospital. He was ready to go. And he just, he was beating himself up at night. He, he had, his eyes were scabbed up. He had just uh, scabs underneath his arms. He couldn't sleep his dreams. He was afraid to go to bed because of his dream. And um, I took him to Bethesda to have a real conversation in the national hospital and um, the doctor that came in, I sat with Joe, Joe said, this is what I'm dealing with. I said, this is what he's dealing with. I've had the same problems. I spoke from a very educated standpoint. Um, the doctor left the room and sent in a young tech who was not part of the conversation to tell us what the next steps were. And essentially they told Joe to take his clothes off, to put the robe on, to leave his phone, he was going upstairs to the oh, side. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm not, this is not a joke. We walked out of that hospital, the national hospital with fucking 600 milligrams of Motrin. Right. That's the joke. He's like, they couldn't even give me 800. Right. And, and it was, I can't make that stuff up. Right. This sounds like a, you know, a medical professional or, or someone from the outside that's looking in and it's going to hear this story and like, there's no way that's, ex that's that extreme. That's the national, that's the national hospital. That's the national hospital that's supposed to take care of those veterans who come home, who have sacrificed. This is a guy who's been through four theaters of war, 30 years of service, 10 years in a defense intelligence agency. He, he was there for the fall of Af Afghanistan. He was asking them, I just need a safe place to rest because I don't feel safe in my own home. And, and they, they wanted to take everything from him and lock, just put him in the pipeline, lock him up. This is. And what, and what does that do? 
I mean, what does that do for somebody <laughs> going nice. through that? Like, you would think, you know, and this is frustrates me more than uh, I'm sure not more than you, but more than anything, really. It's like, how, what what is what is preventing these, you know, holistic approaches? I know the answer is money, but like, why? So just the other day, I was researching. I'm I'm really heavy into um, CBD, um, yeah, and be, mainly because high levels of THC, I get. You know, I was reading about the mechanisms of it and how it affects the amygdala in certain parts of the brain. And I just get most times, more times than not, I'll just get wigged out paranoia. You know, if I if I take a lot of THC, but for probably five or six years, I, I sourced this company. Um, I'll plug them if anybody's interested, but they they they're a, a vetted company, good quality product, CBD out of Oregon. Really? It's really? uh it's uh Lazarus Naturals. Um, they, you know, owner operated very good and they, and they offer, um, 60% discount for veterans. You got to submit your DD-214 and all that, but it's good quality stuff. It's some of the most highest potent, um, CBD you can get out there if you get the tincture, but, um, they do have, uh, which I don't, you know, I don't know how this is legal, but they have, um, 25 milligram to two milligram CBD THC gummies that you can take edibles. And, you know, I, I started this about six years ago. My, my mother-in-law had not Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah. And I had a buddy living in California and I'm like, dude, I've dabbled in, you know, the weed stuff in high school and I just had adverse reactions to it and what it did to me. I'm like, man, I can't have this paranoia. Like I'm trying to relax with my buddies. And I think, I got to leave because I don't trust anybody in this room anymore, you know, and that continued on. Well, talk to a buddy in California and I'm like, man, you got to get me some stuff from my mother-in-law, you know, just to help with her chemo and stuff. I want to have the best, you know, advantage on tackling the stuff. Two years later, she's free and clear. I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe this is, you know, this is something I need to research, start doing research. I'm like, man, this stuff is medicine and has always been medicine. What are we doing? Why is there not enough data out there? You know, oh, every article you read, there hasn't been enough research done. I'm like, why? They destroyed why is... it. Okay, so let me let me just keep the, the simple version. Uh, what happens if, if the entire United States took a real class, and let's just say everybody's going to pay attention, right? Took a real class on the medical benefits of cannabis, and everybody decided to give this a shot for the next 30 to 60 days. Right, what would happen to the Western model of medicine and, and the profitable conglomerate that is yeah. created? Right, right, it would, it would start to fall, right? Because what's happening in states where there is a viable market that produces quality and, and variety is you're starting to see already opioid reduction and prescriptions uh, for prescription medication go down in excess of 30 percent in some of these states in just the first couple years that they have offered. Uh, access to cannabis. So I'm just, you're in North Carolina, right? Yeah. Here's why it's important, right? And this is kind of why our organization is here. Cause I, I went to California probably six months ago to do a dispensary tour to find out, you know, in one of the States who has been doing this for the longest period of time, how are these products marked in a way that is beneficial to the patient, especially the, uh, since COVID that we cannot open and smell. And that is relevant because uh, you can watch one of our podcasts, epilepsy patient. Mm. He can smell a certain strain that stops the saliva in his mouth. He knows that's the one that's going to work for him. Right. So just through his body, his nose alone, he knows that it's going to work for him. Uh, but how going into a dispensary, somebody like myself that, you know, unless you buy it and try it, you're not going to know the experience of it because you cannot open it. You can't smell it. There's a, there's a lot of things that limit you. Um, the uh, amount of information that they provide on the box is very limited because most of that, the box and the packaging is just, uh, you know, uh, this is bad for pregnancy, all the fucking warnings and, yeah. and uh, regulations that need to be put on that box. And so I literally had probably on a sixth uh, dispensary, I literally had, I had, you know, patient, not I say, I call them patients. Um, uh, but consumers coming up to me, I was just noticing the way that they were shopping. A lot of them look clueless. And, I'm, and I just asked them like, what, why, what, why are you using 
and yeah. I, and this is who I am. This is what I do. Why are what brings you, uh, you know, to the store, to the dispensary? Well, I have social anxiety. Well, I have, you know, I'm trying to focus. I have my, my head's everywhere, right? So even though it's a recreational outlet, and what we're finding is, is close to 80% of the people who are coming in or, or, or sourcing it for recreational needs, but they don't have what they need to make decisions. And so, you know, with, the, with Vaha, we take what's called a phytoanalytic approach, right? Because you, I would love for you to come sit through one of our integration sessions. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit later, but you need THC, uh, you know, for, for, for people like us who do have a lot of things that are still buried in the subconscious and unconscious, and you need to utilize THC because it, uh, it directly binds and affects the CB1 receptor, which the majority of the CB1 receptor is in uh, that autonomic nervous system, your central nervous system. And so the CBD is good you know, from a peripheral standpoint, but affects mostly the, the CBT, uh, CB2 receptors, which are, you know, it's great for the immune system and a lot of the peripherals, but you know, what's, what's wrong. Uh, and I wouldn't say what's wrong, but you talked about the structural alterations that happen in your brain because of that ambush, right? This is a way to go back and restructure them, right? So when you, um, agitate or inhibit or, or, or bind to these CB1 receptors, this is the time to do the intentional work to take advantage of advantage of the neuroplasticity and essentially reshape that town that you live in. And so the way cannabis works, one, it brings balance to our primal functions, eating, sleeping, digestion, memory, emotion, arousal. If you look at any veteran who is suffering and has a lot of physical symptoms and chronic conditions, those things are out of balance, the primal functions, right? This is what they're giving us medicines for to eat, to sleep, to wake up. You know, when I talk about arousal, I'm talking about a circadian rhythm, our body's natural production of melatonin and cortisol and making sure uh, that, that those ratios are good to wake up in the morning and go to bed in the evening. But eating, sleeping, digestion, memory, emotion, arousal, you hear about operator syndrome, allostatic load, right? That heavy allostatic load is because we are still in that fight or flight response. Our, our animal brain, you know, took the human brain, said, shut the fuck up, get in the back seat. I got this. And this is how we're going to roll. Mm -hmm. And so when you introduce cannabis, it literally reverses those effects, man. It puts the logical brain back in the front seat and it puts the animal brain in the back. It's just nice and relaxed, having a good time. So it, it from a scientific standpoint, PTSD is, is hyper arousal in the amygdala, hypo arousal in the logical prefrontal cortex. And so when you introduce cannabis, it reverses this response. It allows you to be in the present. Why is this important? Because being in the present, it integrates all of the brain's function, including the learning function. Learning that things are safe again is a learning process. If, I, if my executive function and my, my processes are, are not integrated because I'm only focused on those things that are going to kill me, I can never learn that something is safe again. And I can never get out of that closed loop cycle right so I'll, so here's what here so for example um i know that sushi restaurant is a threat to me right conversations became a threat to me because anyone that asked hey you were in the service that anyone started asking that question became a threat to me so let's just take the sushi restaurant i know this is a threat i know i'm going to sit in there there's gonna be a lot of shit going on my mind and my, my, my body and my brain is going to start processing my mind is going to my mind is saying this place is fucking safe. I'm here with my gorgeous wife, but my body is disconnected and going in a different, different direction. The blood pressure's up. My body's getting, my, my face is getting hot. Uh, my, my breath is getting shallow. And all of this stuff is so normal to us that we're not consciously aware that it's doing that. So the mind and the body starts pulling apart. And the safest thing for us to do is avoid, right? We're going to pull ourselves out of that situation. We never process that emotion. We never get to the root of that trauma. So I know this is a threat to me. I know what my body's going to do. So I have the right strain through a phytoanalytic approach. I consume a micro dose, which, you know, it takes, it, 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 it takes, everybody's different, right? So a micro dose for you is not going to be one for me and, or, or vice versa. So there is time that, that we can coach you through finding that micro dose. But if I take a micro dose and I, I, I shut that revert or stress response off, I'm going to put my body back in this threatening situation. And now instead of a negative outcome, 
I produce a positive outcome. Now I'm showing my body, it's okay. It's okay. This is a safe situation. And so it, it becomes down to a one and a zero. It's either become safe uh, or, or unsafe. And the more you put your body in that same situation and create a safe result, you are retraining that default program, right? If you ever read Joe Dispenza, he talks about that default program. 95% of everything we do is a default mode that we are in that is a trained unconscious, subconscious response that we are not having, we have conscious control of over, but we're not consciously making this decision on a daily basis. They're just happening for us. So cannabis allows us to step in and say, all right, hold on. I'm going to regain control here and I'm going to start, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to start producing different results and in, in, in integrating different language into this conversation, producing positive results on the other side of it. And my body starts to learn that this is safe again. And now over time, right, you, you don't want to get to the point where you have to smoke weed in order to go out to eat, right? But this is necessary, right? It, it'd be a different story if the, if, the, if the doctor gave you a pill and said, take this, you know, before you have your dinner, mm. do the intentional work, produce a positive effect, yeah. right? But, but that's not the conversations that are having. It would reduce the stigma and, and people would be a lot more re receptive to it. But unfortunately, in states that you're in, right, mm. you got to consume illegally. So that in itself, for someone who is about honor and courage and commitment and their lives are based in integrity and they're just they're impeccable with their word, right? I have to be a fucking criminal, right? I have to be a fucking criminal. That I almost shot myself in the fucking face, right? Instead of being a criminal because those stick those stigmas were so powerful. And and I think people, I think you asked that early and people don't realize how powerful that is. To me, yeah. consuming cannabis, I became a failure to my father right? Who unconsciously and subconsciously was the most important and influential uh, person on this earth, right? I, I, the voices that were driving me were his voices, right? And so that took, God, and, I, and, and you're talking about a story, right? I, I came home um, and, and I I took over as a chief operating officer for a uh, heavy and civil general construction firm. We took it from, you know, 17 million a year to 200 million a year in, in about, uh, in essentially less than three years, which is tremendous growth. A lot of that had to do with uh, some emergencies down here, right? The BP oil spill was a big mm -hmm. one. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, all the other hurricanes that followed that, right? We, we fell into that early disaster response model. And we were very good at it. So what I did is, is when I took this over, I turned over, transitioned 95% of the workforce. And I started bringing in, I started bringing in veterans. Some of them were my own. At one point, we had 26 of probably the 90 personnel that worked there were, were combat veterans, right? And so when you understand the operational capacity of, uh, of a Marine, right, uh, several of them came from my scout sniper platoon. Uh, I had a couple others that I was winning special operations training group, but, but started reaching out and I brought them in. They brought their buddies in. And so for these emergency response and disaster response uh, programs and projects, you're talking about you have to move fast, quick, efficiently. Uh, this is this was right up our alley. And so we blew this thing. Uh, we blew it up. But um, I brought those veterans in who were having the same problems that I was having, right? I didn't, I wasn't having the conversation that I'm having now because I wasn't at that point in understanding. I just knew that we were fucking struggling. We didn't make sense to a whole lot of people, nor did we fit in with a whole lot of people, nor did we want to be around a whole lot of people. And so instead of being the my, minority, I, I, I started bringing them in to, to be a majority, right? And so now we created an environment where we felt like home, but there were, just the mechanisms are all the same. Although we went through the same things, a lot of the same things, you know, each person, even in that same unit, in that same mission, in that same battle space, you know, each person's deployment is, is a little bit different than the next, uh, even within your own, within your own platoon. And, uh, but the mechanisms are all the same. They, 
there are certain things that we did not talk about, right? It was, it was, I remember we, they're still down here now. They own their own homes. They have their families. Um, it's been 14 years now, but we were probably there six to seven years and realize, you know, myself and uh, Sergeant Tanetta, he was a chief scout for the, for, for the scout sniper platoon. And he sat down and he started sharing stories about the deployment. And I'm just like, Holy shit, that was you. That was you. Right. And and I and I through these conversations and I would do the same. And he's like, holy shit, man, that was you. We didn't talk about the same things that we experienced, right? Because we didn't realize how much our body avoids that conversation and just builds a life on the other side of it. And it's not until that hot coal gets pushed, mm-hmm. right? That 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 side comes out and it's just like, oh shit. Oh shit, there's something here. Um, and then we go back to that external influence to make it better and to mend it and to keep our mind off of it. But we never go back and truly heal and, and get get to the root of that problem. And so that's that's what our conversation. I, I don't even know how this whole thread got started, but this is this is this is the focus of what we do is getting to that root of the problem. And so it's a, it's a tough conversation essentially because what's killing us is the unprocessed emotion. And so to heal, we have to process that emotion. And after processing that emotion, we have to rebuild those new habits because our body naturally wants to go back to those 95% uh, default mode and those habits that are already there. And that's a very powerful force. Um, But to go back and, and, and to, to rewire and retrain those, those new habits. And it's, it can be a very difficult conversation. And for guys in our community, it usually gets to the point where they are out of options that they come to us or we are at the intersection where we can actually start having these real conversations. Because the truth is to heal, we have to feel and we have to be vulnerable and we have to be, and this is hard for very tough men to start saying weak shit, right? And, 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 and all the stigmas that surround it and, and mental health and therapy and psychiatrists and uh, and weakness and and, and 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 the whole emotional word. I feel sad. I feel angry. Right. I feel right. Just just makes you want to slap yourself in the face. You know when you. But that is from the mentality that I once had. Right. We did not get close to those conversations, and. And the fear that someone might see weakness in us as we still carry that mission to hold the line, whatever fucking line that was, right? There's a line in all of our efforts, whether it's the line on the battlefield, whether it's the line back home, you know, that everybody's flirting with, you know, to keep them out the brig when they come home, you know, but but just we have to be the strong ones, right? If we're going to achieve our true strength, we have to get in, excavate, acknowledge the weakness within. And, and you know, through our programs, one of the, uh, the common theme that comes out is the cure for the pain is in the pain. Because guys like us will go out and fight anybody, right? I don't care who you are. And we're probably not going to win, but you will remember us. Uh, and there's a good chance we will win. But uh, this is a fight that from our experience and the number of veterans uh and tough individuals we put through our program this is probably one of the toughest fights of their life because they have to go into the battle against themselves without a weapon and it's inside and it's uh and as you start getting close to our retreat model and uh and and using the psychedelics and even doing some of the intentional works with cannabis your body will start flaring up your body will start purging your body knows what's coming right your body and your mind separate, even though you're not consciously thinking these thoughts, your body knows what's coming, right? It's, there's a natural intuition there and it's going to start purging. And there's a, there's a lot of fear that comes out in the process and it's, uh, you have to sit in it and, uh, you have to sit in it and you will address what comes up. And there's a lot of things that are going to be very unexpected, but, um, it's going to show you a true path to healing and that path to healing is is is, is essentially tools uh, to find your true self because 
that's it, man. The kingdom is within. And, uh, and once you find that, once you see that it's, uh, you can't unsee it. And, and so I get incredibly passionate about this conversation. I created a program around my own experience. And so I, uh, just, just like anything we do, I would never ask you anything to do anything that I haven't done myself. So I, along with my first sergeant, we went and, uh, and we started dabbling and, and we started experiencing all these modalities and we started selecting and I experienced it a number of times. The first handful of ceremonies was, was, was for myself. And, uh, there was a lot of excavation. There was a lot of pain. There was a lot of work. There was a lot of great things that came about it that brought significant change. And then we started, you know, sitting in ceremony to evaluate practitioners and facilitators. And uh, I myself am, go am going to the rainforest soon uh, to get trained and, and to facilitate uh, these shamanic medicines, these natural antheogenic medicines, the, the venoms from the toad, the, uh, uh, the vines and the, uh, the recipe for the ayahuascas and, 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 and um, being able to create this so we can have the most affordable option so we can start getting our brothers and sisters through a lot quicker. Um, but we select these practitioners uh, and bring them in, those who serve and hold those medicines and have reverence for the community that they're going to be serving, right? We have the Assistant Secretary of Defense that served under General Mattis. He sits on our board. SEAL Team 6 commanders uh, that served alongside him, uh, retired in 2018, that are very still very instru in instrumental. You'll see them on NBC News essentially every day. Uh, but those are members who sit on our board, uh, who I personally went to Montana, sat with, stayed with in their own homes and said, and I've served, you know, uh, served with them as well. Um, but to have the conversations about what our community is dealing with, the answers that we're, we're, we're being giving and the methods that we're being given to heal and the inefficiencies and the deficiencies in that process in the program. And, and the truth is, is that we're fucking losing and we're losing bad. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to change. And so these are not small people that, uh, that have backed us, including the medical advisory board, uh, you know, a uh, gentleman by the name of uh, Mr. Terry Holt, who ran uh, successful presidential cam campaigns on multiple feats. He is our, you know, our media and our public, uh, uh, public relations advisor. So there's a lot of people, good, strong people around this conversation right now um, who we recruited and, and share our sentiments that are doing this for the right reason. Uh, for people like both of you who are just trying to raise good kids and be functional members of society and be leaders within their community and, and, and being, giving individuals just like both of you, the opportunity to rid yourself of that painful past, not the remembrance, not the remembrance of it, but the triggers that produce the physiological imbalances and, and that drive some of that uh, unproductive behavior that are creating hardships whether they're minor whether they're huge but they're still there we need to be given every opportunity to work these wrinkles out because these wrinkles were created by the commitment that we provided to this country right they asked of us we did not ask of them but as a community we are now asking of them because the options that we are being given being given to heal they're different than they were in the past right what we're being given now is actually killing us, right? Legalize the things that are working. We're not criminals. We are the patriots who are continuing to, to, to hold the line for this country. And that time will come again. I just saw yesterday, just saw yesterday, because of the threats of Russia and China, right now, now they are now actively recruiting prior service Marines to come back into the Marine Corps, right? I never thought, I'd, I can't say never here, but here it is again, right? It just seems so soon. It seems so soon. Here it is again. There are things that are coming that I think that we are aware of that a lot of this nation is not aware of. And uh, the, it's, man, it's just a long conversation. I can keep going. Um, the first step is to heal those who have gone forward, right? Because this is not only 
when we were in the shit, when we were in those bad situations, why is it that we went forward, right? Why is it that we said, all right, not only for our brothers next to us, but we also had a corpsman and we also had a fucking plan that says, you know what, when shit goes down, we are going to do everything in our fucking power and beyond our power, even if it takes all of us, but we're going to come in and get you and we're going to bring your ass out, right? And that gave us the confidence to walk into a fucking sit shit sandwich. That's what we need here, right? Because we, we, we need a fucking medevac plan and, and, and we need to, we need to believe in it. And that's exactly, that's what we have. Now we are trying to present that in a way that is falls underneath the legal framework, which we, we have and, uh, and, and ties into a very collaborative and conducive conversation that leads to success uh, on a policy level. And that's not always easy. And so um, we're providing programs to heal. We're taking those analytics and the research that comes from it that is driving the education, the advocacy, and that policy reform. And that's essentially what makes our organization, you know, different from, from a lot of those that are, at, that are out there, right? For the patient, by the patient, you know, created by those who have suffered, who have been out of options, who were given the wrong answers, and who have found the right, am- right answers uh, that have been effective in, in to healing our conditions when we come home. We have those answers. We have effective tools that, that uh, we can absolutely get you home. And, uh, and that's what we're doing. Yeah. Gary, damn, damn. Yeah, man. I, so, uh, so how did, so how does it, sorry, Jose, but how, so how does the individual, if they're interested, because you know, you talking about this, I'm just like, man, this, this is the way, right? Your first sergeant, love, you know, the conversation parts. with your first sergeant, he's like, I'm not doing good, man. You know? And then you guys link up and you start attacking this thing. Well, myself, Am I going to trust Jose or am I going to trust a VA doctor? Right. So if I call Jose and Jose's like, look, man, this holistic approach healed me. I know he wouldn't lead me down the wrong path. I don't know what this doctor, you know, nothing against any of the doctors. I'm not saying that, but I know him. I don't know that guy. So how did how does how does somebody if they're interested in, in taking this journey how do they get involved with this so you can actually go to our, our website we have not promoted this yet we're on a, we're on the final stages of, of working out the, okay. uh, the website for the warrior tribe medicinal assembly a lot of these retreat programs uh, has been an r d phase we've uh, in a process aligning with the uh you know, United States Marine Corps Reconnaissance Foundation, which is a federal entity aligning with a nonprofit entity that talks about cannabis and psychedelics, right? That's a, that's a big deal. Yeah. Um, you can go right now, it's, it's word of mouth. We're going to release that, but you can go right now, go to uh, VajaHealth.com. And if you go to our services, um, and there's, there's essentially uh, retreats, it, one drop down and, and it'll say retreats and it'll talk about uh, you know, reviving that warrior within and, and there's a click the info button, submit uh, at the end of that page. It has, uh, if you're interested, submit it. And then if you submit it, then, then we'll call you back where that's going to be right now. It's, it's not easy. And we have it that way for a reason, because we know once yeah. we open this up, there's yeah. going to be a flood. Um, but there's a lot of things that that's transpiring with this is the retreat is 50%, right? Uh, I would say a little bit less than 50% of the work. Um, there's, uh, preparation sessions, right. That, that, um, that are designed to build your intentions, right. To go into this retreat with very specific intentions. And and we help you with that. We have certified trained coaches. One of them, uh, I'm, I'm one of the certified coaches. Uh, the, the partner, uh, first on Joe Rodnack is, uh, is one of the certified coaches and he's one of the guardians and the guardian program that goes through these retreats. So we're handling you from the time that we talk to you, we're prepping for your journey. You know, we're building those intentions with you. Our guardians that do the prep work are actually going through the retreat with you, a four day retreat process. Uh, and then there is a eight week integration, uh, program or process after that, that those same coaches, are essentially doing the um, the integration coaching. The integration coaching you're going to see is going to be a model that's going to soon replace uh, that talk therapy 
uh, approach because it's about emotional processing, right? And and it's about uh, having those conversations with people who have been there and 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 those like have those like minded experiences, and so that those conversations um, come a lot easier. Uh, but we are there from, from from the phone call to the preparation to the retreat through eight weeks after. And then if you still need some individual work, right, our coaches will sign on with you and there'll be individual work going on. And then, you know, after 60 to 90 days, uh, if we need to go back through another program uh, and go through another retreat to, to do some ex- excavation, uh, we'll do that. Uh, I'm, I had to go back through a couple of times really to eliminate all of the resistance. Right. It was good. To, it's, 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 it really has to be done in, in phases because it's a lot. Uh, but it's going to open avenues of, of emotion and energy. And it's going to start bringing things up that you have to go home and, and, uh, and process through and, and talk through and build habits around. And, and uh, we coach you through that process. Um, and, and, and it's for us, by us. Right. And that's exactly what we're doing. And, and, and it builds on exactly what you said. And I'll give you a story of a gentleman named Tyler Katolka, uh, who we're going to be spending sending to Spain uh, soon to uh, to train with uh, Wim Hof, uh, because a, a lot of our programs built around somatic therapies like ice work, breath work and meditation, very simple modalities that you have access to, you know, at your home. You don't need an ice bath. You can do you can do this technique in your shower. But, you know, these are therapies. Uh, that, that we can take home with us. But Tyler Katolka was one of my, uh, he was a squad leader and then uh, one of my team leaders in, uh, in Iraq through some very, very heavy conflict. And um, he had reached out in a ways that we reached out just a very vague, hey, how you doing, right? I hadn't heard from him in years, right? I know Tyler's not doing very well because we don't, when we reach out, it, it was not, you just know, yeah. you feel it. Um, and I called him and it was very similar to Joe. I said, man, Tyler, how you doing? He's like, I'm okay. I'm okay. I was like, man, I can hear it to you. Hear it, hear it in your voice, man. I'm, I'm like, let me tell you something. My fucking struggled. I struggled. And I told him my story and he said, yeah, I'm not doing too good. And I said, all right. Um, he just had a surgery, uh, replaced the disc in his lower back, uh, the full disc, disc replacement. And, uh, you know, he was supposed to bounce back in a certain period of time, and it's been over a year, and uh, he's still bedridden. He can't get out of bed. And um, I said, man, here's the truth is that that lower back, right, that, that energy center is, is where a lot of us carry that chronic stress. And uh, this is something that the doctors don't talk to you about. Um, uh pharmaceuticals or surgery are essentially the two options that you have in a Western model. And I said, these are something that the doctors don't talk to you about, but I, I really believe that if you come through our program, we can alleviate um, a lot of these issues that you're dealing with. And, and, and I said, hold on one second. And uh, I chimed in, I called first sergeant, first sergeant and hop, hopped on the phone and, uh, and first sergeant shared his story about going through the program for the first time and share a lot of fear that he had. And then, you know, the Tyler was very uh, Christian uh, religion, very heavy religious based. And, uh, and, and Joe came from that background a lot uh, as well. So there was, there was some commonalities there because coming through this program and using some of these entheogenic medicines and talking about spirit and the spiritual aspect of it, right. It's, it's different. Is different. It, it, it's different. It's not one right. There's not one wrong. It's just different. So when someone is deeply rooted in their faith, you know, it throws up a red flag for them. And that's of us necessarily for himself. But you know, what would his wife think? And and uh, and so we got to the conversation. Uh, from the time he called me, we talked to him for about 20 minutes, and then I said, "Hey, man, just think about it, and uh, let's talk again." Five minutes later, he shoots a text and he said, can you guys hop on the phone again with me and my wife? Right away, brought his wife into the conversation. And, and first Sergeant and I uh, had a conversation with, with the wife and him on, and they asked their questions. And, uh, and Tyler said, okay, I'll, thank you for doing that. You know, there was no yes or no. We didn't push in any direction. And 10 minutes later, he said, 
my wife and I both think I should go through the program. And so I, we paid, we covered all costs. Uh, and I brought, you know, there was, uh, I put another six veterans through, uh, in, in that next retreat, but, you know, Tyler came through and, uh, Joe and I went to pick him up at the airport. He was hanging on to a sign, right? Cause, cause he could not even stand wow. going from Pennsylvania, you know, to where we facilitate our retreats. And, and this place was all awesome, is, is, is in Austin, Texas. Um, that chronic stress and the unknown and, the, and anything that is new or unpredictable or threatens the ego or sense of control is going to create a significant level of anxiety and chronic stress and cortisol and adrenaline and, and that physiological response. Right. And it's going to, he's going to carry that right there in his back. So we, when we went to pick him up, he couldn't even hold him. I mean, he was barely holding himself up and he's just, he was not doing well. And I can tell you on the fourth day, he was jumping on a fucking trampoline. Wow. I can't, I can't make this up. I can't make this up. We, we have, we took a, we took a camera crew, uh, with us and we filmed that retreat and, uh, and, and the process that we went through and the medicines and the ceremonies that were facilitated and, uh, and the ice baths and the breath work and the meditation that was done, uh, to, to, to get to this point. And, and then I ended up, uh, hiring the same crew to go back to Pennsylvania to, uh, to do an interview with Tyler, his wife and his children at home, because until you, unless you see it, you won't believe it. You won't believe it. Right. I, it's a ghost story. I can, I can go home and I, and I, and I tell my parents some of this, you know, some of the stuff that's transpiring and, and they're just like, eh, eh, eh. It, it's, it's the truth. And so that's why we're here. That's why we're here because I trust Jose, right? He trusted me. And, and and as long as we can build that container and, and create the safety and the trust and the authenticity, we're going to trust that. And those moments when our backs are to the wall and we trust fucking nothing and no one, right? They're going to trust this because this is a very real and viable option. Um, and, and, and they know just through not only what we say, but the things that we don't say that we have been there ourselves, right? I, I sat there and, and, and on multiple occasions, I didn't want to fucking be here anymore, right? I was tired, you know, you know, waking up in my recovery process, waking up and getting in the shower was a fucking win for me for the day, right? That was a win. You know, I would get in the shower every morning. I would sing one verse of Jesus loves me out loud. So that would be louder than the fucking voices in my head. And, and that's a true story, right? That happened a lot. And I would go to work. Uh, and then after everyone would leave, then I would talk to the fucking people that I would see. I would just tell them to fucking leave me alone, right? And and it was weird because I saw the body, the, the human profile is clear as day, but there was no face, right? There was no face, but they were always there, always there. And I'm just like, holy shit, the voices wouldn't turn off, right? The, the I didn't eat, I didn't eat the acid, you know, my stomach always walked around. My, my stomach was always just fucking incredibly bloated and uncomfortable, the, the chronic pain in my neck and my hips. Um, and, and the panic attack, if anybody's ever experienced the panic attack, right? It got to the point where I didn't go and work out or do physical activity because when I started breathing hard, it reminded my body of a panic attack and I fucking avoided, right? The compulsive thoughts would start. And, and I just, aside from my dog, it took him, it, it just, it, for someone who once upon a time said, hey, follow me, you go left, you go right, I'll go up the middle, we're probably not coming back, we're going to fucking do it anyway, um, not for anybody else, but for each other, coming back and being at home where I can't walk outside of my own home without my dog, without being just fucking absolutely terrified, what is it that transpired, right, in that period of time? that created that situation. And what is it that the Western model of medicine is not seeing or just missing that they can't efficiently affect change in this conversation. And, and the truth is, is what you come, the, the, the reasoning that you come to and the evidence that continues to mount 
to that it is going to affect the profitability of those decision makers uh, who are making the decisions. And uh, it's disgusting. It's disgusting when you see the amount of pain and seeing how it has influenced uh, because of the profitability, profitability of an industry that in the world that we have lived in, you were born in 87, I was born in 77, you know, so many before that, they have not known anything else. My mother is the same one, right? She, she said it the other day, you know, once you have high blood pressure, you can't ever, you, you, you can't ever get off of the medicine, right? That medicine is there to help you the rest of your life, right? That is the, what if I could start a business that said, there are laws that are going to force you to use my product. And then once you use my product, you have to use it the rest of your life. Mm. That is a very fucking profitable model, right? And so what these plant medicines are doing, they're disrupting that. And right. And some of the, some of the problems that we're having with the legalization is we're, we're chasing recreational trends. We're chasing high THC vapes We're we're chasing, you know, high THC flour. We don't, you give me, a 15% THC with a 4% uh, terpene, uh, uh, terpene profile saturation uh, with a lot of diversity in the minor cannabinoids like the CBGs and the CBNs and, and all the CB everything's within them, right? This is not just this THC CBD game. If you can get a diverse plant medicine, uh, um, flower, uh, full flower uh, extract or full plant extract, um, that is medicine and, and understand how to integrate that in a very effective manner, right? Understand what's in the plant, how those, uh, how those things affect you, right? And that's going to, that's going to be done because cannabis is, is very safe and it's impossible to overdose as long as you are in a good setting, right? Try those different strains for you and try them in a way that you can, you can honestly evaluate them, right? Don't, don't crank on them and get impatient and crank on them again because you don't feel the effects. Make sure we're leaving enough time. Um, but here's something, uh, you know, from a medicinal standpoint, you're, you're talking to someone that has asthma. Um, you know, and understands the cannabis conversation. THC and smoke is, uh, is bad. CBD oil is good, right? That's, that's essentially the conversation in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, if you consume flour, let's just say it's a medicinal strain that's selected for you, right? We, we've already been to uh, the process of selecting it. But if I vape that, a dry herb vaporizer, it'll release um, approximately 5,000 you know, different chemicals or compounds. If I combust that, it releases 25,000 different chemicals and compounds. Combustible smoke from the cannabis plant will stop an asthma attack in less than two minutes. It is, a bronchio, it is a bronchiodilator, right? So to have smoking cannabis and the same conversation as smoking cigarettes is just a lack of education, right? So if I want a medicinal uh, response, I recommend no different than the Native Americans did using a pipe, not, not using a pipe. I, I would prefer a pre-roll, but using a full flower, using a full plant where you can get that medicinal value. There's nothing wrong with vaping it uh, or a dry herb vaporizer is different than a vape. Stay away from the oil vapes. Um, you know, that is a recreational. It's very convenient, right? I went through that phase because, you know, it didn't carry the smell, it carried a high THC content. The effects were very quickly, but I realized very quick it led to depression, right? It led to more anxiety. It led to uh, negative health outcomes. And it's it's no different than... Uh, the mercy drugs like Marinol, which is like 90, it's, it's pure THC that was FDA clinically approved in 1974 that they still give uh, at the end of treatments for, uh, for like chemotherapy or, uh, or, or for terminal illnesses, but they're fucking terrible. They're ineffective. And that's, that's what those high THC vapes essentially mimic, right? Go to that full plant, go to, um, uh, good diversity, make sure you, you don't have to be significantly high in a THC, right? There are times for that, right? Um, but most of the time it's not. Uh, diversity in the minor cannabinoids, right? Not just the CBD, not just the uh, THC, but look for the total available cannabinoids and what those cannabinoids are, look at the percentage spread, and then start learning what works for you. And then look at the terpenes and a combination of the terpenes. 
right? This is an easy way. In today's market, an indica is going to have a high mercing, uh, probably a, a high mercing um, uh, saturation in the terpene profile. So if you see a high mercine count or that being one of the top terpenes, then you know that's going to be the indica strain. It's going to be more of a, um, a lower energy. It's not the uplifting, you know, sativa. Um, you know, you said you, you get hyper, you, you get paranoid. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you that that is the wrong strain. You're in the state of North Carolina. You don't have uh yeah. you, you don't have access to quality or variety you still have right. to get it from the street you have no idea what was in it um, and that's a good i not to jump in here but i have a question on that too i mean like what are you what what do you think as far as how this plays out nationally like do you ever when do you see you know marijuana specifically being legalized nationally or do you and when that happens well, you know, the question is, what about what then what becomes the quality of the product? Because if we have big players involved in this game now, as we know, you know, everybody wants to make money, but they don't really necessarily care about the quality of the product that's being pumped out to the masses. So so what are your thoughts on that? Or, you know, yeah, it's uh, it is going to be a natural evolution and unfortunately in a capitalist market like the united states that is going to be that is the trend we're seeing right everybody's chasing the profit so you can take the the extracts and the high concentration high concentrated oils and, and maximize margin based on you know the number of flowers and pounds of flour that you produce and and so for the cost uh, of licensing and a competitive competitiveness and the cost of licensing to come in early in these states uh they are going to push towards these recreational trends because that is what's being marketed that's what's being sold that's what's being driven dri driving the higher profitability to get their money back over time uh so now what we're going to see here is those are going to be a lot of the options and a lot of the things that are made attractive in these new states that are coming online um Go back to that question again. I don't want to. I don't want to lose sight of that. No, I was just, you know, as far as like an legalization nationally, you know, yeah. do you do you do you, do you have an idea of when that might happen? Like, do you believe it's going to happen, or are there still going to be like holdouts? Yeah. I know the Bible the Bible Belt's a big holdout area. You know, yeah, here, North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina. I, I think some of the states you can do it medicinally, but. As yeah, as... and that and that's where our focus is, right? I was the first patient in Louisiana, and then I testified in front of Congress. Um, uh, testified in front of Congress, and then became the very first patient in Louisiana. And then, you know, the North Carolina General Assembly called, and uh, I, I went up and uh, took a team of veterans up there. And, and uh, two years ago, and just an incredible amount of momentum, we got it past the Senate, got it into the House, and then, you know, they started playing their political games in the House, and yeah. and it's kind of stuck right there. They're they're playing that now, but. You know, there's 38 states now that Kentucky just came online that are uh, that it is legal. But in in a lot of these markets, including Louisiana, it is still uh, it is still very slow moving. Um, yeah. Ohio is a great market to um, Ohio and Florida are great markets to look at of, of, of what it looks like when it's done well in a lot of ways. Um, simply it, it is a medical market, but there is quality and variety in, in these states that are trying to limit competition. The answer to getting to a more patient friendly market is increasing competition, right? The more competition you get out there, the better products you're, you're going to get, the lower prices you're going to get. You got to start allowing these craft growers to come in, um, and, and growing at a very, at a small scale, but just, uh, growing some of that craft seven nine finger right. product instead of the you know the commercially you know every 12 weeks you know we're, we're pushing through a crop cycle and getting products and this is coming through indoor grow very controlled performance enhancing nutrients some things that are over time it's going to it's, it's going to get played out yeah. um and you're going to start seeing these recreational trends that are driving the market now you're going to start seeing more of a medical voice because now that I have that illegal access to it, I don't fucking have to hide it from anyone. I can start opening the conversation about it. And then with that conversation comes education. So I don't want to buy this shit anymore. 
I should be buying this shit because this is the stuff that produces the good outcomes. At the same time, you know, there are new patients that come in and they start with these high THC vapes because they don't want their parents, they don't want their their loved ones or whoever, you know, to, to smell it or to see it or to even to know about it. And it eventually leads to a bad experience uh, and some addictive properties to it. And, uh, and then they get away from it altogether. And then they're just, you know, cannabis isn't good. I tried it once. All right. Mm -hmm. You tried it with the fucking trends that are, you know, that are, that are being marketed and educated to you right now. And there isn't a enough of an educational voice in the right manner from a medicinal efficacy standpoint and a performance enhancing standpoint, right? Because I don't care if it's recreational or medical. I don't need a doctor right now to tell me that this is, uh, that this is legal for me, right? If, if I can get a plant that has a certificate of analysis that I know went through a quality controlled process that has been tested for heavy metals and pesticides, and I know it is clean and organic, I would love to go into a recreational dispensary and be able to have access and select in that manner, in that customer experience. I shouldn't have to, to go to a doctor, right? But these are the laws. This is the process. This is the evolution of the program so that we can, yeah. as a nation, get our talents in it, maintain control of it and profit uh, in it. I think from a federal legalization standpoint, I think, I think some of the, when it flips, people are going to be like, oh, wow. You know, here we go. That changed everything. And then they're going to realize that nothing is going to change, right? Because right. the rights are in the hands of the states. And that's where, you know, our focus is, is even in that federal conversation, right? Some of the new legislation that's being released is the States Act, right? It's the right, it's the sovereignty of the state to choose. And uh, and we see the resistance right now but between the, the leadership at a governor level and the leadership at a national level. These governors in the South would just say, hey, you know what? Go fuck yourself, mm -hmm. right? They will. And, uh, and so it's, it's being placed on the states. And so it's critical that, right? One of the things in North Carolina, one of the big things they, they talk about is, is uh, it's the same conversation and the, and the same opposition that we face right here in Louisiana. It's coming from the law enforcement community because uh, of a lot of the funding that uh drives and, and supports their organization you know uh through some of that criminal and, and illegal activity uh and so when you start decriminalizing and, and and now you take the cannabis conversation which they use as a first offender and then that second offense you know comes with a higher crime that gets put into their institutions that are um that are essentially paid for by, you know, uh, government and state and, and federal stipends, as long as you keep in the institutions full. And, and, and it's, again, that's, that's, that's that never ending cycle. So there's a lot of big money, uh, and, and power influence that is, that is at the hands of the, that decision and that conversation. And when this, we're seeing the same thing in North Carolina and South Carolina, as we, we've seen in Louisiana, um, which is ironic and unfortunate because the law enforcement community, no different than the veteran community or, or the ones who need it most, right? They're, they're right there with the, the high suicide rates and, and the chronic condition. And, uh, and so it's, 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 it's a hard conversation because the law enforcement community becomes our opposition, but at the same time, our brand colors are the colors of the law enforcement community because that is our people, right? If you're waking up every day and you're putting a fucking bulletproof vest on, there's a good chance that you're going to have mental health issues yeah. <laughs> in, 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 in the years to come, right? To just to do your job and you're fucking underpaid and, and, and you carry the, the, the weight of, such, of, of essentially the bottom third of, of the economic and cultural communities that you serve because you're, that's, that's what you see every day. And they are the ones that are having to come back home and go to their doctors and the doctors that are recommended by their, you know, the, the law enforcement communities. And they're, they are all trained by the same, the same institutions that, that, you know, buy into the pharmaceutical strategies. This, this is, uh, you know, this is one of the, the active uh, uh, activities that we partake in is, is uh, we're helping law enforcement and firefighting communities uh, and their unions recognize this as a viable medicine. There's a lot of communities, firefighting community, especially who's having trouble meeting hiring quotas because they're still testing for 
TC metabolites in your system, mm -hmm. right? Even for guys who are using this to get a good sleep at night so they can go in and do the work the next day in the morning and be the best version of themselves. You know, they're being penalized and, and they're, they're getting their careers and their, and their uh, just their retirement and everything taken away because of this cannabis conversation right now. And it's, uh, it's, it's criminal, it's negligent, and uh, it absolutely needs to change. I got a, I got a question for you. Um, so 80, 90% of our generic drugs come from China. You would think under the name of national security that we would have already legalized this to displace ourselves or remove ourselves from you know, the hand of the CCP. Has, has that approach uh, been taken or discussed yet in some of this policy making? Yeah, it absolutely has. And, and this is, here's the thing is I try not to get involved in that complicated conversation because if I can go in your state and make it legal, then that gives me access to come and I can work with you from your home and I can teach you how to heal yourself outside of the Western model. You know, we'll send you a biometric device that, you know, you can quantify and, and, uh, and look at that pattern recognition over time to see what your body is doing at rest. If your HRV is low, if your resting heart rate is high, if your uh, sleep is, you're not getting levels of REM and deep sleep so that your body can recover, I know your body is carrying a high allostatic load. Right now we have a starting point. You give me 30 days, even 10 days, right? With one of these devices on, I can start outlining a plan of recovery and uh and healing for you and, and don't take that recovery word in a bad way it is recovery because we do have to recovery from the fight that our body has been fighting our body and our mind has been fighting for a very long time so we can uh have a this is a starting point this is a benchmark here we are now this is where we want to get right in that process we can show you an equation where you have your neurological, your physiological, your biological, that's on, that's on one side of the equation that nobody sees, right? If we can control that, then we can control the right side of the equation, which is the family, the occupation, the spiritual aspect, you know, your daily social integration. If there's a breakdown in this, right, you're going to see a breakdown on that right side of the equation. If your body is not resting, there's a good chance I can tell you what the right side of the equation looks like already, right? is you're not in a great financial position your family's uh fucking battling or just uh you know holding itself together uh by the strings you don't have a great relationship with your children your uh your occupation is is, is going down the tube you're not where you want to be your negative self-identity and self I, I i talk is is so toxic at this point that you literally have to be grabbed and be pulled off of that fucking hamster wheel and that's what we do man we just we got you we got mm -hmm. you you gotta surrender and um, that's it, man. And, and so when you see the simplicity of our program and then you see the complexity of this bullshit that's happening at a national and, and state level that's governing our health, fucking sick, man. And, and we've created a model that, yes, our findings are going to allow us to bring great value to that conversation. But we create an organization where we're not reliant on anyone we and we don't need this fucking conversation right because we, we can show you how to heal yourself and so as long as we can get our voice out to those who are in need come into our circle give us a shot let us help right we're all here we want the same thing we, we want a better life we want a better uh world to live in we want a better country to live in we want to be leaders within our own community we want our basic needs to be met. You know, we don't have to want to have to wake up every day feeling like we have to fight to survive, right? And, 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 and to be able to do that, we have to learn what it's like to relax again, right? To our mm -hmm. body, that is, that is foreign. That is foreign and that is a threat. And so there is a process to get there and that's what we do. And, and we're having a conversations with you that the doctors aren't having. They're not having, right? I'm, I'm pre-diabetic. You know, two years ago, pre-diabetic, and I sat and I, I asked my doctor, I said, she, she said, you know, you're pre-diabetic. we got to watch this number right here. And, uh, and I said, okay. So, and I, I knew right away what was causing it because I'd already been, you know, digging into these studies. And I said, so well, what are your, what are your thoughts here? And the same old shit, right? If you eat noodles, 
eat half of them. If you eat rice, you eat half of them. I'm, and I didn't say this to her out of respect. She's a great doctor, but I'm, I'm just like, are you fucking kidding me? Right? You dropped a half a million dollars on your education. And this is the response that you're giving me right now. You have an entire nation that is dying from stress. Look at the numbers, the chronic pain, the neurodegenerative disorders, the increase in asthma, the increase in, in autoimmune disorders among um, amongst the female population, uh, the, in, in the increase of hypertension, right? This is a chronic stress response. This is an imbalance in, in the HPA axis, the dysregulation that is putting our body in overdrive that is creating these conditions, right? And I asked her, I said, have you ever heard of stress-induced diabetes? And she said, mm-hmm. no, no. But if you listen to one of the leading physicians out there right now, Dr. Gabor Mate, right? And, and then you listen to the lead, leading uh, trauma scientist, Dr. Van der Kolk, Dr. Uh, um, uh, shit, I forget his name. Um, but if you listen to those, uh, those core conversations, it is, it is the chronic stress response and the way that we are having conversations and treating the physical symptoms, chronically suppressing the physical symptoms has put this nation into a mental health crisis, unlike any we've ever seen. And it's only going to get worse. And so this is not just the veteran community. This is the entire nation. Look at the suicide rates amongst our teens right now. One in four yeah. kids who leave elementary school are leaving on a fucking pharmaceutical, right? Do you think that pharmaceutical is ever going to stop? What are we doing? What are we doing as a nation, right? And so this is where uh, the, the, the small unit leader, the community activator, this is one of the biggest ways that the veteran population can step in and change this country. We're only 7% of the national population, right? But we carry a big stick. We carry a lot of weight uh, simply because of leadership abilities that we have and abilities that we have to go in and activate a group or a community or a state or a nation. And so what if as a, as a group, we understood this mental health and physical health and well-being conversation so well that we can drive a program that disrupts, disrupts the Western model of medicine without their permission right and and within the legal frameworks of this country and that's what, that's, that's what we're yeah. doing that's that's uh at the heart of what i've been attempting to do so yeah i always i always ask you know what there's so i ask generals officers everyone there's going to be a day where we don't bounce back and that yeah. day is coming it's social mimetic and genetic entropy there's so much disorganization as a result of these toxic conditions that are compromised, not just in the physical space, but in digital spaces, they're compromised. And as a result of it, our bodies cannot take it. Too much is happening too fast, all at once. People are deprived of so much things or don't even have anything. And at some point it's gonna catch up and we're, we're already seeing it. That's why we're in the recruitment crisis. That's why we're seeing increased hyperpolarization. That, I mean, the, the whole works. So, I, so part of that is, the United States has never asked, and I use this big word partly because I'm trying to, I'm trying to get away from academia or from anyone else. Um, we've never really took the time to develop a, a biocognitive infrastructure that was suited for biological systems to sustain themselves and longevity and quality of life. And we're at the point, it's just bizarre to me that we've created all these technologies, all these programs we have. Ivy League institutions that drive a whole host of frameworks and policies, but we've never really looked at it in, in, in this sense. And we've introduced more detrimental frameworks all the way going back you know, from the 16th and 15th century, where we had this like proto-psychology of advertising that has really done a damage to who to this brain, which is contrived of narrative components that once it becomes a contagion it you know that trauma that arises from it allows this accessibility and vulnerability for that narrative to be changed creating more of a psychological loop or or more of an impact not knowing or forgetting who we are or where we are and on top of that we're in this transition we're not even in this transition we're in world war three and you know that's very arguable but 
were against nation states that have developed sophisticated information uh, data vectors that are impacting us to the point where it doesn't matter if we have institutions or organizations that are doing this type of work. The impact is so, the veracity of the impact is so powerful that people cannot heal. And so as a result of that, we need a grand strategy. We need an upgraded paradigm. And, and that's why I want to take that, that process to the policy level, because we've never really asked this question. It's like, it's like people, it's like taking a, a heroin addict to some type of methadone clinic and giving them, you know, the therapy supports and then saying, now go back to the zone ones where relapse is that much higher. And, and that's where we're at, is that in order for the, these network states or these micro organizations that have full impact are doing the work and are making a difference, in order for them to sustain themselves, we have to adapt as a country. And, and that's a scary thought for a lot of folks because on one level, people have never thought you know, well, well, why are we at war, and why is you know why why should we consider, you know, my county uh, to be a, a particular danger? And, and this is what I say all the time: is like, if we took all three thousand counties in the United States and we reassessed the the bioregional viability, meaning that if we took the DNA components of what makes that particular county uh, different and unique and more. Uh, positive in terms of just a biological sense of thing, or a biological sense of, of how it's healthy. And then we amplify that rather than looking at this mechanism through pharmaceutical or as a, as a result of underinvestment. So like in the state of North Carolina, there's 28 counties that don't have, that don't have not one single psychologist. And there's over, there's close to 3 million people uh, living in the state where they don't have any access to any mental health supports. That is a critical infrastructure in a time that cannot be um, left uh, to, like vulnerable. Th that's how we're gonna end up losing or at least str uh, struggling or dealing with more internal impacts. And no, so- It's happening right now. Yeah, I, yes, yes, it is. So, <clears throat> Part, part of part of my solution to it was uh, looking at a future of mental health through self-sustaining teams by utilizing artificial intelligence and biometrics to assess the to assess what's actually happening inside the body and teaching people how to read biometrics and then looking at individual protocols. So uh, I know sometimes in our podcast I, I, I ramble on about all this stuff and. Um, in short, every one of us has the answers, and we've, we've already stated this, every one of us has the answers to our own mental health issues. The thing is, is that there is a science to the evidence-based approaches, and there's a science to unlocking or deciphering the individual protocols. So just like there's genetic variability and mimetic variability, there's individual variability. So like, for example, not everyone's going to wake up at 2 a.m. to start their process. Not everyone's going to microdose psilocybin mushrooms like I do. And, and that ranges in between 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams, right? There's, and, and not only that, there's the, the narrative component, right? How I immerse myself in these meta narratives. Uh, and so doing all that, I believe, it has to be encrypted. And not, not everyone takes the stance that I do, but there's a group of individuals that I, that I work with that understand that the veteran population, yes, the whole of the United States has been under a sophisticated attack to undermine its, its global preeminence. And not that, you know, I want to be some type of like superior nation or anything like that. I just, you know, at, on one level, I never came, you know, I never wanted to come back from war. I went back the third time to, to end it there. But I survived as a result of, you know, my, my brother doing, taking that for me. And I didn't know what to do with any of that. I never saw myself being in suicide prevention. I never wanted to be any of this. All I wanted to do was fucking farm and write books. But here we are. And so the viability and the survivability of this demographic hinges upon the actions that we take today in order to encrypt this community. and. Again, uh, there's a, 
I, I think a lot of it has to do with like the disunity and the, the way a lot of these other things like suicide is taking over the narrative, right? Uh, the, the hyperpolarization is taking over the narrative. So there is no time to heal, process, or educate ourselves. So it's, it's, it's been a very difficult balance to, to attempt to do that. It, it is. You know, think about it. If, uh, if you're on a patrol, right, and, and nobody really understands what the mission is, Right. where's that patrol going to go and what, how many, you know, how many obstacles, how many, how many resets, how many, you know, there's, there's going to be, uh, there's really no opportunity to gain momentum in any single direction because there's no clear intent, no clear admission and uh, mission. And so this is, this is essentially what's going on in that mental health space right now. What you're starting to see is, is an awakening. There's a, there's, uh, like in North Carolina, even though the policymakers are not pushing it across, there's 90, over 90% support uh, for, for legalization of medical cannabis, but they're playing their own games at the policy level. Um, from um, the awakening standpoint is, is people just like myself and, 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 and just like you gentlemen who were given the options to heal, have played by the rules, have learned through struggle, unfortunately, that those ways are not working and, uh, and, and have crossed the line and found ways that have worked that this country has made illegal for so long. And, and that is a, a huge conversation that is happening right now. So the, the goal of the Veterans Alliance for Holistic Alternatives and essentially what we've created was the, the holistic VA. You have cannabis access. We have uh, um, psychedelic retreats. And then we have the education advocacy and policy reform, you know, in Baja. Um, and, and to start reshaping this conversation because the truth is, is that because of that trauma and that unprocessed emotion, there has been a consistent and constant disconnect between the mind and the body, right? Now, the further that disconnection continues and happens, the more you will suffer or suffer from a biological and physiological standpoint. The healing process is to reconnect the mind and the body, right? And, and, and I know you probably hear that a lot but what does that actually look like right when the mind and the body is an actual coherence which allows you to trust and open yourself to the heart's intuition it's called it's called heart intelligence right and and that intuition out of the joy and the love and the and the uh the gratefulness that you feel on a regular basis in in my case and in so many cases my body didn't know how to feel joy again. It didn't know how to feel happiness again. It didn't know how to be relaxed again, right? Those situations were very threatening for me. And so just like I said, with the intentional work is I had to take myself from that chaotic state and that angry, that anger, that anger is a sense to regain control. That's exactly what that is. Uh, it, 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 it served us well in, uh, serving our country in those situations and when we come home it does not serve us well and in, in, in our day-to-day -day lives in, in, in most situations and so what we have to learn is we have to teach our body um, what that heart coherence feels like what it feels like to relax again what it feels like to be in the present what it feels like for somebody like myself there was no feeling and until my I didn't realize how much my emotional system was shut off even though I did a significant amount of work utilizing cannabis until I did my first deep dive in my psychedelic experience. And that opened up pathways where I could literally feel again. Like when I, there was a happy moment and I felt appreciation and joy, there was literally a warm feeling in my heart. And that was totally fucking new to me. I'm just like, holy shit, I'm feeling again. I could feel sensations in my legs. I could feel sensations in my stomach. We don't even realize that that is trapped and those 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 sensations are shut off right because you try to shut off the pain and the and the, and the anger and, and and you know we can do a good job of of compartmentalizing that but what we don't have control over is the other side where there is the happiness and the joy and the and, and the, all the, the the good side of the emotion that you know we spend our lives searching to feel these things but when we shut off and 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 dis disassociate from um, one side of the equation, 
our body naturally shuts off the other. We can't, we can't do one or the other. And so for the longest time, we build a life and a behavior around just being emotionally numb uh, to these uh, to emotions in general. Emotions are the energy that moves us, right? This is what's rooted in vitalism. This is essentially the, uh, uh, the energy within that, that moves us and mobilizes us. That is the spirit of us, right? That warrior spirit, that energy, uh, our perspective that drives our thoughts that create the emotion that leads to our behavior, right? Our, the problem is in our perspective. Because of our perspective, because of the unprocessed emotion, we think certain things. Those certain things that we think generally lead to certain emotions, and those emotions drive those uh, life-saving behaviors or, or preparedness behaviors or whatever, the, the behaviors that we have that we continue to convince ourselves that, that these are Product, productive behaviors, but they're not. They're maladaptive behaviors to avoid the emotion that uh, that that is that is unprocessed. Right? When is the last time that we have sat as a community among the medical professionals and we talked about processing emotion? Right? As a healing journey. Right? It, it's not there, but that is the answer. That's the answer. Right? And they have not figured out how to create a profitable model around that whole processing emotion. So we don't have it. When you have a physical ailment, you go to one hospital. When you have a mental ailment, you go to another location, right? The mind body is not taken into consideration. You go see specialists if you're having problems with your uh, a skin issue, right? One of the big things I broke out with, with rashes and eczema, like uh, all over my face, this was stress response. Um, but you go to a physical condition. If you're having irritable bowel syndrome, you go to another specialist. You have uh, migraines that you can't get rid of. You go to another specialist. God forbid you tell somebody that you're seeing people, right? Then you go to a fucking shrink ward, which those things stay inside. But you don't ever go to one who has the mind in the body and takes that into account uh, and what's going on in our daily lives and, and how are we managing that, spre- that stress that has never had or, or that that has never been that has not been brought together in a single conversation that I've had with any one of my practitioners. <clears throat> and I don't know if you guys have experienced anything different. Um, it's just it's not existent. But that is the answer. It's not the profitable answer right now, and that's why we're not having it. But if we can get yeah. the veteran community on the same page, with there's a lot of it that's moving in that in that direction right now. The veteran voice carries a significant amount of weight. Uh, at the policy level in all conversations, simply because uh, we are the conservative Republican party in a sense um, that is driving a lot of this, a uh, lot of decision making, uh, decision making. We're, we're the veteran who defends the country. We are the patron who patriot who holds the country's values to his heart, right? You know, we stand and, and put our hand over the over the heart and, and, and pledge our allegiance and we'll continue to do so. And because of that, we carry a lot of weight in these conversations, but it it's, it's insane. When I sit all these, when, when I, when I sit at the table with all these intelligent key leaders in the medical and political profession, and they're just, you know, they're, they're bringing out these fucking vibratory magnets that you can connect to your head and, and tie to you, uh, you know, access the iCloud. And I'm like, dude, have you ever tried just to sit in a quiet room by yourself? That's I, right. I bet you can't. Yeah. That, that is the answer, right? You need to be able to do that and, and sit and, and understand that this is the path and then sit with uh, qualified professionals who have been there, who have done that, and who also understand the tools and the techniques to start extra, uh, extracting this uh, in a way that's productive and efficient, right? And um that is the answer. And so the truth is, is that we're not on the same page. If we, if we want to take this patrol somewhere, you know, let's clarify what that mission is and then clarify the things that are working and make a decision and fucking step off. Right. But that's, you have a few organizations that are starting to do that right now that are trying to, to um, grow a community behind them as well as fight the resistance that is coming from the powers that, that be and are profiting as they are right now. And so it's uh we got to thread that game with a needle right now and it's uh is frustrating you know especially you know we're moving with a sense of urgency because the guys are dying today and there's gonna be more that dies tomorrow and uh this is a conversation that can't happen fast enough and um 
I hope that answers your question. It does, Probably. it does. Um, um, I, I will say this, I know here in New Hanover County, uh, there's a, so I just got certified as a, as a full community resiliency model teacher. And um, the CRIM uh, model came from the TRM, which was the trauma resilience model that was, um, those are evidence-based approaches that were founded as a result of returning service members from Iraq. It actually went through Congress. Congress, you know, plotted it, but nothing ever became of it. It was never really integrated into operational forces or the veteran community. And so the biological model of attempting to regulate allostatic overload or allostatic load kind of just became, um, it, it went into the shadows as a result of what I believe is a kind of like a, an outcry as a result of these 22 a day. And, you know, that's a lie as well. Um, the current evidence that's coming out of the American Warrior Partnership and what the VA is saying are totally complete different narratives. Um, there's actually more veterans committing suicide as a result of uh, overdoses, um, specifically opioid overdoses. And that goes into the whole thing that I've been attempting to say is that when you're cultivating the conditions or this pre-maneuver phase or this decisive shaping of the battle space where you want to completely eradicate or undermine a, a national power, you're going to do things subliminally. And when you have the streets, um, you know, propagated with all this crap and you have the conditions of trauma as a result of toxic environments that are not trauma informed or even resilient focused, and guess what? You're going to go to the thing that's going to erase the pain or attempt to erase the pain. And oftentimes it's either laced with fentanyl or it is fentanyl, or people just don't know what the hell they're buying. Yeah. But what I, what I have seen in New Hanover County, or at least from what I've assessed is there's resiliency task force that have been set up. So they do a lot of education and understanding ACEs, adverse childhood effects, ACEs, the uh, protective and compensatory uh, actions taken that create, you know, uh, good uh, behavioral and medical outcomes for longevity, rather than looking at it just through, you know, oh, if you have 10 ACEs, then guess what, or six or more ACEs, guess what, your, your, your lifespan reduces to 20 reduces by 20 years. Um, a lot of the work that I do um, right now is I'm attempting to adapt that model for the veteran and the operational community because a lot of folks, for some odd reason, mental health is weakness, but it actually, and I get in arguments all the time because people think I'm justifying war or operations. Um, as long as there are, as long as there are, our militaries, there will always be that component. And if you're going to do war, the least you could do is do it fucking right and teach the guys. What's, what's that? Yeah, uh, I got a question for you. Sure. What does your body? So, what does your body feel when I say mental health? I feel good, like phys like. Do you feel, do you feel a stigma? And what does your body feel when I say mental toughness? I, I when it, mental toughness makes me feel resilience, like resilience. I have resilience. I resilience. can move forward. Resilient, right? Mental health is resilience, right? But there's a stigma tied to mental health. And I'm glad you bring that up because when you say mental health, right, it's, it's psych ward, it's weakness. It's my career's over, Right. But mental health is mental toughness, right? If you have the resilience and the self-regulation skills to productively and efficiently and in a healthy manner process a lot of those hard emotions that we feel, and you can also facilitate that same process for a team underneath you, you're unstoppable, right? So you are a mentally healthy leader, platoon, person, whatever that case may be, but you have to engage in the mental health practice. And that is the emotional processing, right? If I'm going into a wrestling match and, I, and I'm a national champion wrestler, and this is, this is, this is a match is going to determine my career, right? I can either go in and fight that in a way that not to lose, or before I go into competition, I can address some of those aspects that are, that are consuming a lot of my energy. Hey, I might lose today. I'm afraid this guy, this guy has a, a, a mean low single. He has the ability to finish and, and he has ability to, uh, to come back and, and reattack and reattack and re whatever it is. But this is, this is what I fear. 
This is what I fear, and I'm going to acknowledge that. Now, what is the best way to, to, to defend against that fear? But once you start, and this is what I do when I speak, right? When, when, and, and I did it in a North Carolina testimony, which I would, I would encourage you guys to watch. But the first thing I said is that, look, anything new, unpredictable, threatens ego or sense of control is, is very difficult for me. And, and I'm, this, it, I'm extremely nervous. There's a lot of anxiety. And, and so excuse me if I fumble. But I just get out and say, this is the shit that makes me nervous. I don't know who the fuck you are. Right. I'm, I'm going to say that shit out loud because now I feel better. Right. Now that if, if now you know that I'm nervous, then I'm good. Right. There's no secret anymore. I'm not hiding anything now. Now I'm in a better position to fight. And and yeah. and and that's that's essentially the mentality. So mental health. Right. Because growing up playing sports, uh, being in the military. Right. Mental toughness, mental toughness, mental toughness. Right. Mental toughness is mental health right? You don't just become mental tough because you avoid the emotion and you don't process it and you just become a hardened shell. No, you self-destruct over time because you're not putting the fucking work in, right? Mental toughness is putting the work in, doing the tensional work. And so if you want that resiliency and that credibility and that, that sustainability over time, then you have to be mentally tough, which requires uh, investing in your mental health. So that conversation in itself just needs to be it needs to be changed what yeah no no totally um it, commanders need to hear that and i think yeah. breaking it down into their language is a lot better this is kind of the cognitive domain is you know we're we're, we're in an all domain um paradigm where there's all domain impact and the cognitive domain is where they're getting our forces that's where we're getting hit the hardest dysregulate the brain the brain is a chemist. It's going to produce all the chemicals necessary for your body to properly navigate. And if, you know, and they're not, they're not thinking that partly because I think too, there's this kind of like stoic, stoicist paradigm that has infiltrated for a very long time. You know, if I can keep it all in, hold my bearing, then I'm, then I'm, you know, I'm the, the sage uh, warrior that Sun Tzu talks about. Right. Um, and, and that's a very difficult generational after hundreds of years of warfare and study of warfare that's a very difficult thing to break and, and this is why i always tackled it from like the automation emotional related information spectrum because there's now data vectors where you all you just produce is a data set with the proper visuals color tones and audio and guess what it's going to get an emotional you're, you're going to get evoked emotionally and it's going to have some type of an impact on your brain and, you know, if your arousal continuum is already offset and you're not making rational decisions or logical decisions as a result of you being in fight or flight, or if you not getting in enough sleep, guess what? You're not going to make the proper decisions. And, and so again, you know, that's the, that's the whole science evidence-based approach that has to be taught at least specifically for like the operations forces. And I think, I think the work that you're doing in terms of like the veteran demographic, uh, is, is going to break down a lot of that, but it's got to get translated into a, a language that these cats can actually utilize where they're not going to lose their, their careers. Um, that's a sad thing, man. I, 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 I was just thinking about this too. I, I, a couple of times when I was in the fleet, I, I, I don't remember anything being talked about in regards to PTSD. And if there was like a situation, they separated the guy from the entire like battalion. Like they just moved him away. They, they don't know. They, made, they don't know what PTSD is. Right. They, no. they, they don't. And, 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 and essentially what it is, is, and here's, here's simplified. Trauma is not what happens to us. It, it, it's what remains inside in the absence of an empathetic witness, right? So if a tree falls in the woods, and I talk about the empathetic witness, if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one around, uh, does it make a sound, right? We don't know that. And so if human experience is a relational experience, we need the social experience, and it looks different for everybody, even if it's just one person, uh, but we need that relational experience to survive and, and to thrive. And so that empathetic witness is to have someone in life that you can get these unprocessed emotions, these 
words, right? There, there's something that transpired that we don't even have words for yet because we have not sat with it long enough to really conceptualize what actually happened to, to make sense of it. And so the process of healing is sitting within it, you know, reducing uh, the flames and the heat that we feel and, and, and so that we can sit with it and start to conceptualize what happened, find words for it. Finding those words is what is creating that file folder. And then in time, we can eventually take that experience and file it away. And now that falls within an emotional regul regulatory system that we actually have control over. But until we process that emotion, which it sounds simple, right? Saying it out loud, it, it's, it's not simple. Uh, but there is a simple process uh, con consistently done over time that, that you, can, you can absolutely achieve that mission. And using plant medicines and the integration of plant medicines, we think we can do that a lot quicker, alleviate a lot of the time and the pain uh, in that process. And so PTSD is the unprocessed emotion that remains inside of us in the absence of an empathetic witness. That is PTSD because that's one of the things where I dove into trying to understand this conversation and where we were with it as a nation. And it's fucking interpreted in so many different ways and, and they mm -hmm. make it so damn complicated and so damn institutional and it's regulated and governed and quantified by the DSM-5 and, and, and all these other psychological associations who, you know, 30% of their annual budget is uh, made up by the pharmaceutical companies that support their efforts. So you know, dumping these pharmaceuticals into our mental health needs is, is, is the thing that is killing us, right? And, and that's the truth. And I will say that to anyone. Um, simplify PTSD and what it is, right? And, 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 and also take that identity, right? This whole service, this, this, this whole uh, disabled veteran thing, right? And take the, take the identity off of the person that is struggling with it. You're not just someone who has PTSD and you're going to have that the rest of your life. You had something that transpired in your life that you don't have a file folder for because we don't have that file folder for any sensory experience is being detected for a threat. And there are unconscious and subconscious triggers that will drive your physiological responses in ways that are outside of your conscious control. And because of that, our mind and our body disconnects, right? That trauma is stored in our body. Our body is our subconscious mind. So when we're sitting somewhere and we start feeling the hair stand up on the back of our, of our neck, because once upon a time, this was an unsafe situation. A kid's going to walk up and detonate himself. But now I'm here. I'm sitting in New Orleans with my wife. Hair goes up on the back of my neck. I have to leave. So what's happening there? My body in this situation is my unconscious mind. And because of my painful past, this is the thoughts that are now being created in my mind that something bad is going to happen because I feel shit standing up on the back of my neck. So your body is driving the action. And that's something that we have to understand. 95% uh, of our actions are in our body. Our body is the subconscious. We have to pull the mind out of the body right? And that's getting into the present. Plant medicines allow us to do that. And then we need to get inside of that black box and start changing some of these wires around and, and then retraining the body to what that new feeling feels like. That is the healing process. It is fucking as simple as that, but we make it so damn complicated so that we can continue to push those pharmaceuticals, right? Because what's the easiest way right now? If I have a group of people who are out of options or, or, or a group of people who are, are all experiencing the same thing and we show them some natural plant medicines and uh, and then there's a doctor that stands up on stage and says hey we did this study and there's negative effects right that's going to cut that fucking room in half right just by saying those words yeah right and if you look and you understand what that fda clinical trial process is and how it's no different than the fucking lobbying game that's played and it's all driven the su success of an fda clinical trial is driven by the uh, the money makers and the funders or, or the people who are funding this trial and the amount of money that gets pushed through and the people they select, you know, to govern that response. It's no different than a lobbying game, right? So our whole goal here is we're not going to play that fucking game with you, right? We're going to show up and be productive and, and have meaningful conversations when we need to. We're not relying on the federal institutions. We're not relying on the state institutions. 
under the current legal frameworks, which is why we, the, the Warrior Tribe Medicinal Assembly, we operate under a church, right? Because we're utilizing the same laws within the United States that are essentially uh, recognized for the tribal nations and the indigenous who use these sacred medicines for their cultural healing practices. That's what we're doing for these warriors, right? Come back home and, and before uh, uh, the gringo and our laws and, and the white man started getting involved in, in changing laws to uh, essentially facilitate uh, the healthcare uh, practices that, that govern our lives, there were natural ways to healing before this profitable profit model started to, to present itself in the 20s, right? It was in the indigenous shamanic ways. You can trace it from Egypt. You can chase it, trace it to South America. You can trace it to right here in our own backyards uh, of these methods and practices being used. <clears throat> you know, it comes from venoms from a toad, right? And, and some of the practices that we use, we, uh, when they come through our retreat program, uh, we use the, uh, the combo ceremony, uh, which is the giant leaf frog, is the venom from the giant leaf frog. Um, and uh, we use a psilocybin uh, or ibogaine ceremony. The psilocybin is obviously mushrooms. It's a very heavy dose uh, that, that extracts a lot of the emotions uh, that are deep within that we don't have conscious access to. And then it's followed up by 5-MeO-DMT. Uh, it's actually the real venom from the Bufo alvarius toad. Um, that we inhale. So these are these are natural medicine medicines produced by nature, by the earth that that we are using to uh, to realign our uh, our physiological and neurological symptoms, and they absolutely work. They absolutely work. Uh, we prepare you for the journey going in. We are there with you during your journeys and continue to reinforce those intentions, and then we are there uh, for the integration process after and. Uh, we take the same simple modalities of healing, which is processing uh, the emotions and, and those intentions to get to them, to excavate them and understand them, and then to be able to accept, connect with, and embody that experience going forward. And uh, the results it produces, it doesn't lie. It doesn't lie. And it's, uh, it's, it's nothing short of there's nothing short of healing. So yeah, it's, I, man, this is, I, I know I see you shaking your head because sometimes when you, when you hear this and, and you understand the struggle that we're in, uh, it doesn't make sense when it's simplified in the way that it does. It's just, it's, it's just mind blowing that it's, it's that, if it's that easy, yeah. why are people not just fucking buying into it? All right. Because they're protecting their own stash. Right. And, and that's, it is what it is, but uh, we're about to blow this son of a bitch wide open. <laughs> That's the truth. I hope you do. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, once you get it, get it rolling, if you want to come back on here, you know, I, I know you said guys can go check it out and see what, what you're about and what you're doing. But once you start really getting it moving, if you want to come back on and kind of. Man, I'll always come back on. This is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this 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 platform, man. However, we can amplify. I'm not. I, I'm a huge advocate of not being on social media all the time. And uh, but if people send me or have something that they want out in the public, uh, a specific time or whatever, I I will be more than glad to share or network um, as best as I can. Um, because uh, again, I don't have all the answers in, you know, to all of this. I just know what I know from my experiences and, and from what I see. And, and again, you know, that individual variability ranges, you know, there's people who would actually do more of the, uh, the psychophysiological work rather than, you know, the substance route. Um, but both in time, I think they'll see that have major impact. Um, I'm, you know, again, I personally use I was introduced to microdosing through a uh, credentialed therapist who went through Rick Doblin's organization, and she's actually attempting to try to creating a clinic where she has actual, I don't know, like psilocybin peer support for those six hour, eight hour sit-ins um, to create the healing clin clinics. But it's been a challenge here in North Carolina. 
maybe that's maybe that's some, someone I could introduce. She does a lot of work with um, Bajun and um, uh, Marsoc. I would love to. Um, yeah, and actually, the individual who entered who uh, so the microdose that I got it from was from a, a former uh, team guy out at uh, Marsoc who does executive level uh, retreats. Yeah, and um, man, the first time I, I took a microdose. I felt it, you know, within 30, 30 minutes and so you talk about psilocybin. Yeah. Psilocybin and yeah. the, the organization, the organization that I get it from, um, they're, they're a veterans group as well. Um, they're called mushroom doctor. Um, and they, they have, uh, capsules. Uh, so for now I use a thing called mental mastery and mental mastery has like B12, neocene, lion's mane, and hundred milligrams of psilocybin mushroom. And so that's specifically for just focus rather than the, uh, the micro booster, which comes from 100 goes to 200, 300, and I think 150. And I used to use those for sleep. Um, when I, I would take it around 6 PM and, you know, by the time seven o'clock rolled around, you know, I was, I was ready to rack out. And when I woke up the next day, the inflammation was gone. My back wasn't in pain. Like none of it was, I didn't have as much pain as I, I normally do. And, um, I haven't done the dose or, or full dose and I've taken a higher micro dose and it's, it's kind of bizarre. I get scared and, and I've, I've listened to so many podcasts and so many testimonies. It's just like, you just got to let go, but it's it's yeah. scary like so that's that's the answer and i'm glad you brought that up is to surrender and that's some of the preparation uh going into it right that's that's not in our vocabulary right when's the last time somebody said the answer here is surrender <laughs> that doesn't, yeah. That doesn't yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't sit well with this but that absolutely is uh the answer and, and when you learn to surrender and you surrender through the breath right and, and the breathing techniques but when you learn to surrender and, and you continue to do it over and over and make this a part of your daily practice, then you, the more you surrender, the more you start to notice and become aware of the resistant points, you know, in your thought process, in your life, and in the way that your body re reacts. Okay, I just thought this. I didn't even realize I was holding my breath for the last 30 seconds, right? Yeah. Have you ever played, you know, Contra, where there's that? Oh, you know, yeah, the yeah. The super code and contra that gives you whatever 30 men or uh your breathing is the super code right and and that is is uh and you can see that through heart coherence techniques when you establish heart coherence and seeing what your heartbeat and your breathing is doing vice when we're in our normal state which is generally on the front end fight or flight you know moving forward or moving away or just moving in general and it's and it's and it's very you know, just, uh, it's, it's all over the place. Um, yeah, I, for, I forgot where, I, where I was even going with that, but, um, so we're the, talking about surrender. Yeah. Surrendering, right. And surrendering, I'm understanding the mechanisms of surrender and understanding from a thought process to a physiological process, but surrendering is the answer. And that's what psilocybin and a heavy dose does is that it reduces the ego and allows you to see some of those painful past experience in ways that you've never seen them before. And so there's a lot of fear because it's naturally going to move your body to that unprocessed emotion. And when your body starts getting close to it, you feel your body changing, you feel your body becoming fearful. Uh, but when you do that heavy dose and you learn to surrender, it's a roller coaster. It's just dark and here it comes and fuck, I'm afraid. And, and everything inside your body is just absolute fear. And then you just, you focus and believe and, and focus on the breath. And with that fear, your body moves you through that thought process and that experience. And you come to the other side and all of that preconceived notions and the fear that was built around that unprocessed emotion, you were able to see in a way that you've never seen it before and bring resolution and create a file folder for it. And it does that when you take that heavy dose, it gets down into the trenches and starts excavating a lot of those unprocessed emotions, things that we don't want to touch, things that we didn't even know were there. Uh, and, and then, you know, it, it starts to take a kind of a, there's not really a chronological sequence, uh, but there is nothing that is off limits. And so for me, a lot of it was the combat trauma. And then after the combat trauma, then it starts, 
you know, going past the combat trauma and, and what you realize with a lot of people who are coming through the program is that the trauma from a childhood perspective, you know, whether it was trauma or little trauma or, or the way that uh, the perception that was created and the ways that we should live our lives and the things that we should value might not, they, they might be off in a way that was, uh, you know, kind of misaligned or there was a bias from the teacher that was implementing that perspective upon us, which is generally our parents or surroundings or whatever. But, and then we start getting in, in, into that. So it's, there's nothing off limits here. And it's a, uh, it's a full internal exploration and uh, we're good at going forward and, and defending against the threats that present themselves out here. We don't know how to do that when a journey goes inward. And so uh, put the weapons away, put your hands away, put all the, defensive skill sets that you have let's, let's let's put those away we'll put those in the closet and that's some of the preparation we learn uh in the process and, and then you just absolutely surrender and it's it's fearful right you you're talking about a micro dose couple hundred milligrams uh like 0 0.2 0 0.24 grams anywhere from 0.24 to 0.36 grams uh to a half gram where you know wherever you, you are most of the micro dosing is five days on two days off or you'll do two days on one day off two days on one day off but the the interaction with your serotonin receptors and 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 you know the the uh, neurological and physiological effects that it has is undeniable, and the really the only way you can understand that is to experience it. And uh, yes. and the great thing is that 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 it's that it's absolutely safe um, and uh, a hell of a lot safer than the pharmaceuticals, which is why it's a huge threat to the pharmaceuticals. Um, but surrendering, yeah. and moving through it, and then. Uh, you know, when you do a deep dive, which in our program is anywhere from five to seven grams in a single setting, and uh, and and it and it's guided and it's very ceremonial and there's sound healing, there's Reiki, there's energy healing, there's uh, <clears throat> there's a good ratio of uh, of facilitators to uh, uh, to consumers or patients in that setting, um, and and then we have very intentional somatic therapies that go in between that teach us to surrender the ice bath, the breath work, the meditation, and, and really sets us up for success, uh, prepares us to go into these journeys, but it also uh, allows us to embody and accept these experience after these journeys uh, to continue to integrate what it is that we're thinking to what it is that we're feeling and that autonomic nervous system, which are the involuntary systems in our body that, that can keep us going forward is to bring those into balance uh, so that we can go forward and create and not avoid the painful past because most of our lives are, uh, are dictated by our painful fat past and navigating situations and, and uh, to circumvent, you know, some of those fears. And so, come through our program we can release those fears and then we teach you how to live on the front side of your life right and then through a creator's perspective and, and not a survivor's perspective and it's, it's two totally different things i'm so glad you're doing this um i don't know if you ever listened to any of like sean ryan's work but uh he, he brought on a navy seal um what's his name um Anyway, they take a, a bunch of former soft operators or soft operators out to Mexico and they have an 11 day retreat. And it's a, it's a journey similar to what you're talking about, just extended. And of course, it's specifically for, you know, the soft community, which you got those guys, you know, you know, they've been they've been dealt a pretty heavy hand as a result of, you know, ongoing conflicts and just the um, essential drawdowns where they've had to carry that that load um and i've heard you know sean ryan's experience uh with regard to his experience with um ibogaine and then uh was it the five md or five meo um Bufo. yeah and uh he says what's what's stuck with me from his conversation is we, we all end up in the same place and every time i like i started so there's a the capsules that i've taken but then now I'm doing something else where I've, I've gotten a different um, uh, mushroom and it's a, uh, it's a lot more potent. And when, once I get to those, like that fearful state, that's kind of been like the guiding thing. We all, we all end up in the same place. And I, and I say that for a specific reason, because I know where my, my struggle is. 
my struggle has been uh, attachment, not as a result of, you know, my upbringing, but as a result of, I've had a similar experience. I mean, all of us here have had a similar experience in losing someone to a high explosive and someone dear. Um, and it's impacted my relationships um, for, you know, my greatest regret was losing so much youth um, in between 2011 up to essentially 2019. In 2019, I started my, my real recovery journey uh, where I lost control of my, my, my biological systems. I had to get dragged to the VA to finally start that process. And in that process, I became obsessed with, I got to get better. And I had a son, you know, I was at the point, I was at, I was at the point of checking out, you know, and it's his first birthday. And the only thing that I could think about was just pulling the fucking trigger and ending the emotional pain of just the compounding impacts of not regulating. And it didn't help that I went into the contracting world, came back and all this was hitting me at once. But, uh, that's kind of been like the guiding light is we all, we all end up in the same place. And now that I have two sons, you know, I have new and novel fears, which is something I'm trying to let go. And this is why I don't always microdose, like I'll cycle through. And it, it's just, a, you know, that fear, that, that constant state of fear. And I want you to, psilocybin helps. I want you to come through a program. And I'll, I'll talk to you more about that offline because... You know, one of the, the biggest things with having my son, right, the, the compulsive thoughts, right, it, it was those thoughts, right, when they talk about flashbacks and understanding what a flashback is, a flashback is when your body physiological, physiologically responds in the same manner that it would have responded during the time of that attack. So it's not necessarily a conscious thought. It could be a subconscious trigger that pushes your body in that direction, such as sitting at a a sushi restaurant, right? So it's not the uh, stereotypical flashback that you think it is. Um, but one of the big things that really gave me a hard time after the birth of, of, of my boy, my first boy, were the compulsive thoughts, right? Because it wasn't the fear of me being in a dangerous situation. It was the fear of the things and the people that I loved being in a dangerous situation outside of my conscious control. And so in the state that I was in, being out of arm's reach with him was was a very difficult because of things uh, you know the catastrophic thinking anything that could go wrong became my reality and that was the reality and those possibilities were very real for them when in reality it was very very slim to none um for example uh, I live in a neighborhood where we would all rather be is is on a plot of land away from anyone and everyone you know within a <laughs> within 10 miles um uh, I had a dog that became my senses, but when I had my child, you know, anytime my child would run around the side of my side of the house and I would hear a scream, right? The thoughts that went through my head were not normal, right? My son was kidnapped. He was hit by a car. I was the first responder. I heard it. I saw it. I felt it. You know, everything was absolutely real. Those were the compulsive thoughts that would force themselves in my head that I had to change my behavior and the things that I were doing to consciously get them out of my head. Right. Those were the compulsive thoughts. But it was it was never ending with my sons because there was so much love and fear at the same time. You love them so much. And anything what you start to realize is that anything that you love becomes a liability and you start to distance yourself so far from it so that it cannot be used against you and that starts happening unknowingly and so oh yeah yeah before you know it you're not sitting eye level with your boys you're not uh you're not in the same room because all of the the screaming and the bouncing and the noises are just right you find a quiet place in your garage or wherever that may be um and and that becomes comfort but it's not productive to a healthy relationship and it will it will continue to de to to, to de deteriorate over time and, and the psilocybin does help you know i was on the same journey right i used cannabis to, to do a lot of that intentional work and i i did a tremendous amount of work and uh with just cannabis on my own and a lot of experimentation and putting myself in certain situations you know i used to operate a lot of heavy equipment i had a uh 
you know, full scale mill shop where I had ride along saws that were very dangerous to operate. But the only way I could actually sit on them and stay on them is if I if I microdose cannabis, right? Because right. it took me out of that stress response. And I can sit in one place for a significant period of time. And that became very productive. There was clarity, there was focus. It removed the compulsive thoughts, it removed the chronic pain, it allowed me to sit in one place and, and actually finish a task. And, and, and so because I was self-employed, I didn't have the risk of being tested by an employer and all that. I was able to dabble in the experimentation. And, and I proved very quickly that everything that they're saying about cannabis and psychedelics was bullshit, right? And I started microdosing psilocybin in the same way that, that you did. And that was totally a different effect, a higher vibration than cannabis. It, you know, when I, when I consume right 0 0.25, 0 0.24, 0 0.25 grams, it gave me the effect of, that the Adderall would give me, right? And with clarity and focus and energy, and I'm just like, holy shit, and it's natural and there's no withdrawal symptoms or effects or, you know, when you when you don't take it the next day, there's there's not a craving. There's not a craving right. that you want to take it, right? So, you know, even Tylenol, caffeine, Adderall, right? You look at the withdrawal effects when you stop taking these things. Um, the opioids is a different story, right? The, the withdrawal effects there, but with cannabis and psychedelics, there's no withdrawal effects. And, uh, you know, these are, these are actually natural medicines that you can take tolerance breaks with to reset your receptors, uh, you know, so you don't have to take as much um, to get those same effects. And um, you take a tolerance break. You see everybody, anybody take a tolerance break from opioids, right? You yeah. see take a yeah. tolerance break from Adderall. If anybody's been on Adderall, you know, that third day being off of Adderall, you, you essentially have to separate yourself from your fucking family because you're just, you're an asshole. <laughs> uh, it, it is what it is, but that's, that's the truth. And that's, that's the conversation that nobody's having, right? This is the real shit that's happening. I understand what your study says, uh, but I'm telling you what my body is telling me. And I'm telling you what these other, you know, thousand people is who have been, you know, through our program, uh, through, uh, the same situations. Uh, um, this is what they're telling you, right? And and, and together, it, it just at some at, at one point at at some point in time, you have to start arguing against the quantitative data that we're putting on a table to prove that this is working. I understand what your laws say, and understand that some of this stuff is in a gray area, but also understand that my guys are fucking dying every day. So I don't really give a shit what your laws say we found a way to make this work and, and we're going to fucking bring our people home because, you know, God bless the ones who have taken their lives, right? They, they, they're at peace now. The ones who are still in it, right. Who are fighting every day just to get back to the dinner table, to sit with their boys, to sit with their children, to sit with their wife, to, to start creating a conversation, to forgive me for the fucking bastard that I have been for the last six to 10 years and have created difficulty in your life and my children's. And, and I know that those things will never be taken away or forgotten, but I am a good person, right? And, and before I went to war, this is the person I was. And uh, when I went to war, I came home and I asked for help and this is what they gave me and it didn't fucking work. But if you look at the effort I put into it and, and, and what I exposed my body to because they said it would help me, there's no denying that I was fucking trying. I was trying hard to, to, to heal, to get back home, to be that productive member of society and the playbook and the rules that they were putting on the fucking table and the pills that they were shoving down my mouth created the person that I became. And I found a way around that. And, and for those who are struggling right now and having problems getting back to that dinner table, I just asked to, to reach out, right? Just come sit with us come sit with us, come have a conversation, bring your wife, right? Bring your spouse, just whatever it takes. And, and we're going to do everything to get you there. We're going to do everything to get you home. You know, with our program, what we're working through right now, outside of the R and D uh, aspect of it is uh, creating a profitable path so that those who can pay for it are paying for the ones who can't. And so most people who were in a, in a situation like I was in, I couldn't put fucking gas in my truck. You know, once upon a time, I ran, a, uh, I was a leader of a company that did $200 million in revenue. And five years later, I can't put fucking gas in my truck, right? Because I lost executive function. I lost 
the ability to sit in one place for a significant, a significant amount of time. I didn't eat when I did eat. It was a fucking brownie from, from the convenience store because I couldn't sit in line long enough or, or, or concentrate long enough at my own home uh, to put a fucking meal together, right? There was, I always had to be somewhere. I was on a fucking timer and you're going to lose. You're going to lose. And uh, I don't care how strong you are or how strong of a person you are. Once that sinks its talons in you and gets you on that hamster wheel, unless you pull yourself and disconnect in order to reconnect, you will die on that hamster wheel. It's only a matter of time. So this is just, is just uh, man, this is, this is a, this is the new purpose, right? It, it just, uh, having a conversation with you guys today, it just, uh, it's, it's a different level of conversation when you talk to people, you know, who are, who are suffering and uh, who deal with it, who are currently dealing with it. Um, so we're just, uh, we're absolutely real in our approach. We're very practical in our approach. We've, uh, we've created uh, an incredible uh, network and organizations um, that are, that are self-sufficient and not reliant on uh on any outside influence uh, that can provide a healing path for those in need. And so it's not only for the veteran community, it's also those outside of the veteran community, uh, including the spouses uh, who have been traumatized because of our trauma. Um, you know, we're here for the trauma conversation and, uh, and, and help people achieve better lives. And, and the answers are, are inside. Right. Anytime we find ourselves chasing external influences, which I did, right. If I fix this, if I fix this, if I fix this, this is going to create the peace and stability that I need. And then you, once you get there and fix those things and you sit with yourself, you realize that that imbalance is still there. So we got to get in the work and, and, and do some deep work. And uh, at the end of the day, the cure for the pain is in the pain and, uh, and we'll help you through that process. That's powerful, man. Um, it's interesting. You, you said a lot of things that, that Nietzsche, Patrick Nietzsche says, um, it's not one of the quotes that Paul used at the beginning, whenever we first started podcasting, is to live is to suffer, but to, to find meaning in the suffering is to live. Mm. And, and when you stare into the abyss, you know, be careful because the abyss stares back at you. And, and that's the internal work that needs to be done. And I know, yeah. So it's very, yeah, thank you, Gary, for your story. Sharing that, I have a lot to chew on today, tomorrow throughout this entire week. Um, this was, this was a, a surprise. I didn't expect, I did not expect this. And yeah, anyway, no, I, 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 I appreciate you. it. Very grateful for you and what you're doing. And uh, I'm sure we'll probably get a lot of the guys are going to be hitting us up, wanting to know more and, and whatnot. So stay in the loop. We'll keep you in the loop. We'll, we'll, yeah, we can't let you go where you're doing, you're doing, you're doing the right, the right stuff. Um, I can just feel it. And yeah, you guys are obviously extremely passionate about this. Um, I think the right answer here is let's continue to collaborate. Let's continue to have conversations and, uh, and, and find ways to work together. Cause I guarantee you, once you put this out to your community, you're going to have somebody call that needs yep. to through a program and probably doesn't have the money for it. So even just through a collaborative conversation like this, we can create opportunities like fundraisers where we want to sponsor this veteran to get him back to his family, whatever that may look like. And uh, there's a lot of things we can do here together, but, you know, just recapping on some of the things that were said here is uh, we have to look within our own community because those are the people that we're going to trust. We've looked outside of our community for a long time and we don't trust anything that's out there. So let's bring it back to within our, our, our own community and, and, and find these real programs that are providing healing. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people standing on the X right now, and, and that's our priorities. Let's get some of those people off of the X. And then, you know, in time, we will get them back and we'll continue to, 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 uh, to build on the different stages of, of that post-traumatic growth and, and, and help provide the life that, that they want to live. And uh, that's a real possibility. I don't care. I don't care, you know, it, uh, what situation anyone is in, if they're in a hole that they think they cannot get out of, trust me, I was in that fucking hole, son. Um, and there was no bottom, there was no bottom to it. And that was a scary part. And, uh, 
but I'm here and I'm back and, and every day is a grind, right? Uh, turn the suffering into the new purpose uh, and, and, and find that purpose within that suffering. And, and that's exactly what we're doing. And uh, there's a better life on the other side. There absolutely is. I believe that, yeah. Yeah, let us help. I think, uh, yeah, through this conversation, continuing this conversation, uh, we can help each other in this process. Right on. Number five, appreciate you.